for the last couple of days. Not easy, um, more together time in the home. And uh, I know my role was continuously to get firewood uh, to keep the fire going. And a quick birthday shout out to Sarah Parrott. Um, little did she know that you don't get a day off from a board of ed meeting for your birthday. Not easy. Um, or I would ask anyone to mute. Uh, thank you. So we'll move on to the public hearing on the 2021-2022 superintendent's proposed budget. Uh, several folks have emailed me um, and uh, CDSP and some other folks have provided a list of people that are going to speak. I've forwarded everything that I've gotten up to the last few minutes ago out to the board. Uh, Michelle, our uh, behind the scenes um, Zoom operator is helping us and she has the list, so she will work through the list. We will also have the opportunity uh, for those folks that didn't uh, ask to speak, we'll see if anyone else wants to speak after we go through the list of folks that have um, you know, sent in information requested to speak. So. We'll start from there. So Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Deneen. Good evening. Our first speaker for tonight is Christina Baudu. Please unmute yourself and you are recognized. Hello, I'm Christina Boudou at Four Kona Road. I'm a parent and a member of the board of DAEG. I am feeling very frustrated by the conversations of the BOE concerning IDEA, specifically the Achievers Program. Our Achievers teacher, the IDEA program director, and the principal of our high school share the view that the rigor and workload of the Achievers class supports an increase to a full credit elective rather than the current half. These three professionals are all in agreement. However, this was met with opposition from the board. Some rationale seemed to be based on the perception that it consistently suffered low enrollment or that it didn't fulfill a need for gifted learners. When enrolling in Achievers class, students face several hurdles. So it is reasonable to expect some reduction in ninth grade enrollment compared with the eighth grade. It is only a half a credit, the only elective offered at the high school that meets for two semesters, but is only worth a half a credit. So a student enrolling in IDEA is either expected to give up earning a half a credit or double up. It is true that Achievers may not be the right class for every IDEA student. It is a common trait of an IDEA student to feel very passionately about specific elective subject areas. So in most cases, when a student chooses to do Achievers class, they are in fact giving up a course of study in a field of interest. The fact that there's consistent enro enrollment and notably many years of high enrollment actually supports the point that currently there are no other offerings that provide this particular educational experience. Also, students enrolled in Achievers work alongside their other ninth grade IDEA peers who share their distinct perspectives and advanced level thinking, which is fostered by our fantastic IDEA teachers throughout the program. As wonderful as the IDEA program is, we welcome a review that looks at whether our district is meeting the needs of gifted learners, not just in IDEA class, but beyond. We shouldn't just take out what may seem to not work but built upon the wonderful program our IDEA teachers and administrators have developed over the last few decades. Also, I heard the words update and review of IDEA used interchangeably the other night, and I'd like to clarify, there's a big difference. Ms. Johnson presented a thorough IDEA update as recently as December of 2019. From what I recall, there were few questions posed by BOE members back then, and DAEG was disappointed that the update did not result in adding a review of IDEA to the board's master agenda as we had asked for at public comment months before. Eventually, the strategic plan may offer valid options that are comparable to our current Achievers program, but we're not there yet. I welcome a review of the program, but we all know that this is not something that can be concluded this month or even this school year. Our eighth graders are making their selection of courses right now. So for these reasons, that time. I respectfully ask that you, one, support the increase of achievers to one credit for next year, and two, conduct a thorough review of the program by professionals in the field to have the best set of facts before acting on any consideration to cut achievers. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bodu. Our next speakers are two in one, Ms. Julie Best and Lori Olson. Please unmute, unmute yourselves. You are recognized. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, I am Julie Best. I live at 38 Red Rose Circle. And with me is Lori Olson, who lives at 16 Little Brook Road North. We're the co-chairs of CDSP. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and for the hard work and thoughtful choices that have gone into this budget proposal. You'll hear tonight from a few parent representatives of CDSP on various budget components relevant to their schools. As you know, our mission is to help share the voice of the parents. This year, that process is harder, but thanks to technology and the diligence of the PTOs, we've been engaging parents and soliciting feedback. Thank you to Dr. Adley for attending multiple PTO meetings to discuss his budget with parents. In general, most of what you will hear falls into two categories. One, making sure there are adequate resources to meet students wherever they might be next year. And two, ensuring that this budget can support reasonable progress forward for our district while also affording the new status quo. In the last year, we've experienced a tremendous amount of change. One could argue trauma even. We recognize that everyone has worked tirelessly to deliver the best educational experience possible, but we need to understand that there have been deficiencies for students. Whether academic or social emotional or a combination, there will be shortfalls to address and problems to solve. In other words, we need to be prepared for a period of recovery. And we have to expect there will be incremental costs associated with this recovery, even if it's hard to define them all today. This may not be the year to eliminate team taught classes or paraprofessionals as these support our learners. This may be the year to guard even more closely for small class sizes that guarantee the most effective student teacher ratios. Regardless, we urge the board to recognize that there will be a need to be financially nimble to address this recovery period. Regarding the new status quo, it's important to recognize that we aren't going back to something. We are moving through a pandemic and where we arrive will be at a place forever touched by the lessons we learned in the, the past 10 plus months. While it's possible that some of this change, such as our expansion in technology, would have come eventually, the pandemic accelerated this change at warp speed. There are costs in the budget that might have increased gradually over a number of years, but are now built in costs of doing business. We certainly support the district in continuing to fund the replacement of outdated devices, Wi-Fi upgrades, new software, and additional staffing for tech support. Even as we move through the pandemic, we consistently hear from our parent community that they do not want 2021-2022 to be a stagnant year. We are happy to see several pr proposals with broad support, including the change in the SESS facilitator position at the elementary schools, the teacher in residence program, and the introduction of an open choice program in our area. In closing, we understand that the community's commitment to educational resources is significant, and the increase in spending is above normal. But we would argue that this growth is imperative. The pandemic has created significant challenges across many aspects of our society, and our current understanding of its impact on our students is na nascent at best. It is, critically, awesome. it is critically important for this generation of students that sufficient resources are made available and that our school leaders have opportunities for flexibility should they find the challenges more daunting than they appear now. Basel comparisons to past years are not useful in this context as no other administration has ever faced this type of challenge. Budget austerity represents the biggest risk to the future of many of Darianne's most at-risk students. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Vest. Thank you, Mrs. Olson. Tiffany O'Connor, you may unmute yourself. You are recognized. Um, thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Tiffany O'Connor and I live at 48 Lee Warden Road. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Darien High School Parents Association. On behalf of the DHSPA, I would like to thank you for what we believe to be a fiscally responsible budget that will allow Darien to continue its tradition of excellence in education in a time of unprecedented challenges for our school community. Team teaching is the first of three topics we'd like to address at this hearing. Darien High School parents have reached out to us to describe the valuable support these courses have provided for their students. The dynamic team taught learning environment for ninth and 10th graders has not only reinforced academic support, but has also helped to build confidence, an important component for future success in high school and beyond. With the proposed elimination of four sections of team teaching, we risk our rising ninth and 10th graders falling behind or starting behind. Secondly, we'd like to address buses and the safety of our students. With parents increasingly varied working schedules, the need for broader access to busing is essential. All students should be able to get to school in a safe and timely manner. 
Reducing the walking radius to the high school to one and a half miles is a reasonable solution. Two miles carrying a heavy backpack, sometimes in the dark or in the rain, is too long and potentially unsafe. Hollow Tree Ridge Road and Naroton Avenue are not pedestrian friendly, especially as students contend with the traffic at the I-95 overpass, not to mention the, the distracted drivers. Furthermore, the proposed addition of two buses for a one-year test phase would allow the district to gather data and revisit the decision later. But for now, Darien lags behind other towns in our DERG in providing essential transportation for its students. Lastly, we want to address social and emotional support, which is challenging as many of the specific needs remain unknown at this time. Over the past several years, the district administration and the Board of Education have made great strides in providing our students with robust SEL support and programming, and we thank you. As we prepare to consider the needs of students when they return to school, we must maintain the resources already in place, as well as anticipate a greater need for SEL support. We don't yet know all that students have missed academically, socially, and emotionally over the past 11 months. We're but we do know, time, Mrs. Thank you. But we do know that it is significant and we must be prepared. And lastly, just a quick huge thank you to our DHS teachers, staff, and administration on behalf of the DHSPA. The parents and students are so grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Connor. Robin Nelson, you may unmute yourself. You are recognized. Good evening. My name is Robin Nelson, and I live at 51 Arrowhead Way. I have two children at Middlesex and one at Darien High School. Along with Tara Worm, I'm a CDSP rep for Middlesex, and I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I would first like to address the projected Middlesex enrollment as it relates to the existing team structure. The Middlesex projected enrollment of 1,100 students reflects a decrease of 45 students, which led to questions as to why there were no corresponding cost decreases in the budget. We strongly believe that it is important to continue to support and maintain the team model going forward due to the large number of students at Middlesex. The literature suggests that the smaller the schools and the smaller the classes, the better the probability of good instruction and successful students. In using the team structure, Middlesex essentially creates schools within a school, thus creating a smaller school environment for its students. Dr. Adley made an important point that we cannot change or increase efficiencies within the existing team structure, since this would necessitate a move to a junior high school model, which middle schools transitioned away from years ago as a failing model of educating early adolescents, based on research such as Turning Points 2000 by Jackson and Davis. Secondly, I would like to discuss the proposed decrease of one library media specialist which would be replaced with a library media paraprofessional. While this change appears to put Middlesex in line with its Durge peers, it does not take into account that Middlesex is double the size of almost every Durge middle school. Other than New Canaan, all Durge schools have one librarian for every 560 students. On this basis, the optimal ratio for Middlesex would be to have two librarians to serve its 1,100 students. The librarians not only guide students' reading selections, but also play important roles um, working with the quiz bowl, quiz bowl team, Geography B finalists, and providing tech support to students. In light of these points, we respectfully request the, that the second library media specialist be added back to the budget. Finally, we support the capital budget items for Middlesex, including a new library carpet, repaving the 23-year-old rear access road, new HVAC air conditioning for the library and main office for which repair parts are unavailable and installation of a new electrical transformer in the wood shop. In conclusion, I appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of the Middlesex proposed budget. Thank you again for your efforts to ensure that Darien schools continue to maintain their reputation for academic excellence. Thank you very much, Mrs. Nelson. Crystal Hill, you may unmute yourself. You are recognized. Thank you.
Good evening. My name is Crystal Hill. I live at 10 Wakeman Road. I have four children and I am the co-chair of the Tokenik Elementary PTO. This school year has felt at times impossible, but amazingly, we are still here with our elementary students still being taught in person. And while we see the light at the end of the vaccination tunnel, the educational cost of COVID will not end once the school year does. Come September, we can't just make the pandemic and its repercussions disappear. We must prepare realistically for where our children are, not where we would like them to be. We must accept the role technology now plays in our students' lives. We must prepare to help those children who have academic and, and social emotional deficiencies. And we must acknowledge that the world around our children has changed. First, we thank the board for agreeing to support the administration's request to elevate SES facilitators to assistant principals. In the immediate term, we believe there will be a lot of remedial work to be done for both general education and special education students. In the long term, we think having a three-person administrative team with individual lenses towards SEL, SRBI, and special education will make the crucial task of addressing every school child's needs collaborative and inclusive. After this year, we know that a fundamental part of educating our kids is through the use of devices like Chromebooks. We thank the board for continuing to support the one-to-one -one initiatives for all grades, and we ask that the first grade smart board stay in the budget. Without these displays, teachers cannot effectively teach an increasingly digital cur curriculum. We also request that all desktops that are no longer of use are replaced, not just those of the classroom teachers. Special teachers should be able to plan and use technology with the same tools as classroom teachers. The pandemic made clear that racial and socioeconomic inequalities in communities throughout the country. And we are pleased that Dr. Adley and the administration have found two programs that help Darien do its part to begin to address these significant issues. We very much support two teacher in residence positions and are excited about the possibility of open choice coming to Lower Fairfield County. We believe these are both programs that would not only benefit individuals in surrounding communities, but also our Darien students. Diversity of thought and ideas broaden everyone's horizons. Finally, we implore the board to leave at least four FTEs in budget control. There are so many unknowns in the coming year and we need to be prepared. Will families keep streaming into town and enrolling young students? Will classroom teachers or special education students require more paraprofessional support? Will we need another ELL teacher in the district should international work relocations begin again? These are just a few of the questions that come to mind when we try to imagine what next year might look like. And it is in this light that cutting any amount of budget control seems so short-sighted. Thank you for your extraordinary efforts to keep educating our students in these unprecedented times and for for proposing a budget that addresses the new needs of our children while still remaining fiscally responsible to our town. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hill. Lisa Sarusi, you are unmuted and recognized. Good evening, my name is Lisa Sarusi. I live at 12 Rings End Road and I have two children at Darien High School. I'm the Special Education Parent Rep for Darien High School Parents Association and a member of the CDSP Special Education Subcommittee. I'm speaking tonight to encourage the administration and board to reconsider the proposed elimination of four teen teaching classes at the high school in the subjects of English and history. Teen teaching classes currently provide a wide range of general education learners with the benefit of having two curriculum teachers in one classroom. My two children have benefited from team teaching classes, so I have firsthand experience with the positive impact that this teaching model can have on our students. It's well known that some of the required courses at DHS are rigorous, such as the Western Civ course, which is challenging for many ninth graders. Team teaching provides a significant support option for students who may feel challenged to keep up with the curriculum in classes like this. Having two content area teachers also provides students with more opportunities for extra teacher support outside of the classroom. It should also be noted that we do not currently offer co-teaching classes in history as we do in English and math. So the elimination of team teaching in history reduces the availability of support for our students. If the team teaching model is eliminated, how will this impact the size and scheduling of history lab classes and the co-teaching English classes? And what other alternatives will exist for our learners? Next year, we will have a combination of new freshmen and existing high school students who will transition back to a full-time learning model after over a year of remote and hybrid learning. 
we may see an increase in the number of students in need of academic support and we should be prepared to support them. The administration has indicated that this decision is due to scheduling and low enrollment, but this appears to be a decision that is made out of convenience for budget purposes and a shift in FTE instead of taking the student's needs into consideration. I hope you will reconsider the elimination of any student support or teaching models during the upcoming year. Eliminating these valuable classes abruptly without further evaluation or a replacement option does not seem prudent at this time. Thank you so much for your time and for all of your hard work this year to keep our students, staff, and our community safe. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Sarusi. If I could just have a reminder that all those people that are speaking, if when you have time, if you've not already sent in your comments, if you could please email them into the board, we would appreciate that. Thank you. Michelle? Our next one on the list, Brooke Gies, you are recognized and unmuted. Yes, hi. Um, my my name is Brooke Geese. I live at 64 Knollwood Lane. I have two daughters, one in the sixth grade at Middlesex and one in third grade at Royal. As we are approaching the one year anniversary of COVID in mid-March, I wanted to join tonight to balance some of the feedback I've been hearing about the school district's handling of the pandemic. There was absolutely no playbook in how to safely operate school in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. I'd simply like to say thank you to the administration, the nurses, the custodial staff, the teachers, and the school board. I believe right now it is imperative to show our greatest appreciation to the entire Darien school community. While healthy debate should always be encouraged, I would just ask that we show our gratefulness and appreciation to those who have spent countless days, nights, weekends, vacations, and many, many hours to pursue the goal to keep our children learning and in a safe and healthy environment. Thank you so much. Ms. Geese, thank you very much. Aaron Lumpkin, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, my name is Aaron Lumpkin and I live at Five Archer Lane. I am speaking on behalf of all of the families of second grade students at the Tokenique Elementary School. We are respectfully requesting the DPS and the Board of Education include in the 2021-2022 budget an additional section for next year's third grade class at Tokenique. Given today's class numbers, the history of the mid-year additions, and the continued trend of families moving to Darien, it is highly likely that this class will exceed the district cap for class sections this fall. Rather than struggle to address this issue later, we believe incorporating additional class section into the budget today is the most prudent approach and one that will enable DPS, Tokenic School, and the teachers to incorporate this adjustment in a thoughtful, safe, and organized manner. DPS policy 6510 states that the Darien Board of Education believes the number of pupils in a class affects the quality of education, and that for grades two and three, the optimal class size is 20 to 22 students, with a cap of 23 students. Today's second grade at Tokenique is nearly at its limit, with one section at the suboptimal cap of 23 students and two sections at 22 students each. Tokenique School typically sees net additional students having eight new students already since October of 2020. The momentum in Darien home sales continues as families leave New York City and move to suburbs, with Darien being a top destination given its excellent school system amongst other positive attributes. It is likely that DPS has not seen the full impact of the sale and homes and contract since many families wait until the end of the academic year before transferring their children. In addition to new families purchasing homes, Tokenique Elementary School in particular is likely to see new student enrollment given it includes the district's largest multifamily rental community, the Avalon Darien. The pandemic has made advanced planning critical, particularly in terms of human resources and physical facilities. Schools need sufficient time to plan their classrooms with a focus on physical distancing for the safety of teachers, students, and staff. Furthermore, DPS stands a better chance of recruiting high quality talent if it can start the recruiting process early. Recruiting shortly before the start of school makes for a rush process that is unlikely to bring the most experienced teachers to Darien. Budgeting today for an additional section in next year's Tokenique's third grade class 
will make the process smoother for all involved and likely yield a superior result in terms of recruiting. In conclusion, we are asking that the DPS budget for 2021-2022 include funds for an additional section for next year's third grade class at Tokenique School. The class is nearly at its limit and market dynamics suggest that Tokenique will continue to see new students due to continued momentum in Darien home sales and the district's inclusion of the largest multifamily rental community in Darien. Adding a section later may not be feasible. About that time, Mrs. Lumpkin safety, building, and human resources constraints. Ensuring an optimal class size for next year's third grade at Tokenique will provide a more favorable learning environment for both teachers and students at this formative grade level. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mrs. Lumpkin. David Ward, you are recognized and unmuted. Good evening. My name is David Ward and I reside at 11 Stanley Road. I have two daughters that attend Darien schools in seventh and ninth grade. First off, I wanna thank the Board of Education for serving the community and working to create the most cost-effective school budget while continuing to help Darien achieve great rankings on a statewide level that we can all be proud of. That being said, the current model that charges students additional fees that, pay, that participate in sports that can't use the school facilities is short-sighted. I believe we need to simplify and spread costs across the whole sports budget. We should review the total deficit and see and set a fee for each student. If it's $100 per athlete per sport, and you play three sports during the, day, during the year, you pay $300. I have no idea what the actual number is, but believe strong that is how it should be handled. If you analyze costs sport by sport, there are significant disparities field use, repair and improvement of facilities, uniforms, coaches, and officiating are vastly different from sport to sport. And some of the traditional sports have significant cost burdens on the overall budget compared to others. The most democratic and fairest approach is to equalize those costs and not put all that additional burden on the students who want to pursue a sport offered by the school district, but doesn't support with, with facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Tara Worm, you are unmuted and recognized. Good evening. My name is Tara Worm. I live at 17 Mystic Lane, and I'm speaking on behalf of Girls Swim Dive. Every budget season, we seem to rehash the parent rental input. I was glad to see that at least there was a consistent rule put into place with the 70-30 split but on further analysis, I disagree with it. Darianne has become pay to play, but only if the facilities are off site and need to be rented. The problem is the disparity of funds per student athlete and between boys and girls sports. There is no consistency. If we want things to be equitable, which is, seems to be a common theme in discussions with the Board of Education, then every student should have the same funds available to them for sports. Let's look at the numbers for girls swim dive compared to other sports. Although you have swim dive separated in the budget, I'm going to add them together because they are one team. They are forced to practice separately because Darianne does not have an adequate space to have them practice and compete together, but their scores are combined for meets. The girls swim dive team consists of 36 girls with a cost per athlete of $1,195.86. That puts them at a less cost per athlete than baseball, boys and girls basketball, boys and girls golf, gymnastics, softball, boys and girls volleyball, and wrestling. Why is it that in trying to defer costs, you only look at rentals? It should be total cost per athlete. Swim dive may have a rental fee, but our transportation fee is only $1,500, when 12 other sports are over 10,000. Our officials are $305, when football and boys ice hockey are $26,000 each. Girls swim dive supplies are 900, Yet football supplies are 19,000 and boys lacrosse is 43,000. In fact, the only team that has less money allocated for supplies is cheerleading at $875. But they have two seasons when any other sport has only one. Tennis, although under 1,000 per athlete, had the courts redone last year for a price tag of 550,000. Why are tennis parents not asked to chip in for courts? The inequities are vast and incomprehensible and there are so many disparities, but I only have three minutes, so I'm just hitting the high points. The last things I wanna point out to point out is the money, amount of money spent on boys sports versus girls. The total amount for boys is 694,000 versus 556,000 for girls. 
This is without sailing, skiing, and squash. The district would not give me the breakdown of girls and boys in those sports without a FOIA request. I'm sure once I receive those numbers, the disparity of funds spent on boys versus girls will only grow. If you are looking to defer costs for sports, I ask that you make it fair. Choose a number, 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 per athlete, and then any sport over that amount should be, should be asked to contribute. But to base it only on rental fees and not total spent is completely unfair and biased. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Worm. Marina Christoffi, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, uh, my name's Marina Christoffi. I live at Seven Buttonwood Lane, and I'm a parent of a swimmer on the girls' high school swim team. I would like to state my opposition to the proposal to include the swim teams in the 70-30 redistribution of rental facility fees for athletic teams at the high school. <clears throat> this decision does not take into account the specific circumstances of teams who must rely on off-campus facilities to practice and play or swim. At present, the majority of the girls' swim team practices are carried out at the Darien Y. Any additional rental fees are incurred because one, the Y cannot provide the team with weekend practice times, usually afforded to other FCAC varsity swim teams. And two, the Darien Y does not have a safe diving facility. And so the dive team are forced to rent time at the New Canaan Y. Under the terms of an agreement following a Title IX review, um, for following Title IX review infringements in 2009, the Board of Education agreed to, among other things, Provide the girls swim team with practice times consistent with the standards for girls varsity swimming. I assume that this means fully funding the rental fees associated with providing facilities that meet that standard. In addition, the Board of Education also agreed to ensure that the practice facility and schedule for the girls swim team would allow those swimmers who are also divers to practice and compete as both swimmers and divers. This second part has still not happened more than 10 years later. Our divers and swimmers compete together as one team at meets outside of Darien, but cannot practice or compete together in Darien. The decision not to build a pool at the high school in 2004 already puts our swim teams at a competitive disadvantage amongst its FCAC peers who have dedicated pools or dedicated pool time. This forces the Darien high school swim teams to fight for pool time in subpar facilities not suited to the needs of a competitive varsity team. Sadly, in my opinion, this is an indication of the indifference to the swim program by the school district in comparison to other varsity teams. An indifference that has resulted in a lack of funding and a situation where many competitive swimmers choose not to participate on the high school swim teams because of the lack of facilities and swimming time a lack that will risk their chances of a swim placement in college. Almost at time, Mrs. Christoffi. Thank you. Um, despite this, the girls' swim team regularly placed swimmers in Division One and three schools and have been FCAC champions five times since 2009. This success is solely down to the girls' determination to succeed and the team's spirit, coaching and guidance actively cultivated by our coach, Marge Trafone. I propose that the Board of Education should cover the cost of facilities rentals for the swim team. This will not only avoid a potential Title IX infringement in relation to the girls team, but also level the playing field for the boys who face the same struggles in finding suitable practice facilities. You are at time, Mrs. Christoffi. All right, I, can I thank the Board of Education for all the hard work on the budget as a Please last do. sentence. Thank you. <laughs> we have completed the, the list and I will move on to the raised hands. Username Darian CPAC. You are unmuted and recognized. Um, my name is Thomas Dupont. I live at 55 Allwood Road. I'm a junior on the boys swim team. The boys swim team thinks this budget change is completely unfair and unfounded. We ask that if budget cuts are to be made, that they be made with equity to all sports and based off overall cost rather than rental cost alone. The nature of our sport, along with many other sports at Darien High School, includes rental costs that are necessary for the successful running of the team each year. We ask that the board consider the burden that will be placed on the parents if these cuts are made. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Dupont. Username Jacqueline Miller. You are unmuted and recognized. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Miller. I live at 84 Fitch Avenue. At last week's Board of Education meeting, in response to questions about the traffic at Ox Ridge during construction, Dr. Adley proposed a simple solution. More, solu more students should ride the bus. It seems obvious. At Ox Ridge, as at any school, more kids on buses means fewer cars in the parking lot. And yet at Darien High School, where the traffic has been the stuff of legends for years, and where there have been repeated calls for more buses from the community, we continue to ignore the obvious solution. Our discussions around transportation are stuck in a non-productive loop. First, we are told that we cannot add more buses to demonstrate ridership until we formally amend the walking radius policy. Next, we hear that we cannot amend the walking radius policy until we demonstrate ridership. We know that historically there has been a need for transportation to the high school from the neighborhood south of 95 that are denied transportation under our current policy. There's correspondence from Dr. Falcone going back to 2010, agreeing to provide a courtesy bus at Town Hall to serve those families. This year's edition of Bus 25 continues this, this tradition, but it's only a temporary solution. We shouldn't have to have the same discussion every year about a service for which the need is so well documented. Beyond the issue of need, there is also the matter of what is right. We have the biggest enforced high school walking radius of any district in our dirt. No other district thinks it's reasonable for students to spend an hour and a half walking to and from school every day, and that's under the best of conditions. How long will the walk from town hall to DHS take in the slush and snow tomorrow morning? How many of us would be comfortable having our kids make that walk? As for the buses that are already guaranteed by the transportation policy, we know that in non-COVID times, they are often overcrowded. According to the transportation study conducted by the district, four of the eight buses that serve DHS have ridership of 48 students or more. In the case of buses one and two at 61 and 69 riders respectively, a lot more. And 48 really is the reasonable headcount for a school bus full of high school size students sitting two per seat. Yet the district evaluates ridership by an unfair metric, assuming that 72 high school size students can fit on a bus, which means three students per seat, winter coats, backpacks, and sports equipment included. I'm thankful to Dr. Adley and the board for the temporary solution of bus 25, but that single bus does not meet the needs of families who are not served by the current transportation policy. The two additional buses that were proposed by the policy committee give the district the flexibility to finally develop a transportation solution that makes sense. Being in high school is hard, that time. getting to school shouldn't be. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. User Debbie Latham, you are unmuted and recognized. That thing. Hi, it's Deb Latham. Sorry, I'm trying to start my video here. If everyone can see the lipstick I put on for you guys. Um, I'm. Deb Latham at 429 Hoyt Street. Um, on behalf of Darian CPAC, I'm asking you to please keep the team taught model in English and social studies at Darian High School. These classes are an important and invaluable model choice, particularly for students in ninth and 10th grade. They provide the opportunity for all students, regular and special education, to have an extra level of support in the classroom. They allow for one teacher in the class to work with individual students who might need extra assistance while the other teacher continues with the lesson. Team talk classes provide positive benefits for everyone. Without the choice of team taught, lab classes will be more crowded, which defeats the purpose of the lab class to receive targeted support with smaller student to teacher ratios. Furthermore, Students can't always fit the extra period a lab class necessitates into their schedules or have to forego taking an elective, which all students should be able to explore to determine their strengths and interests. Thank you for consideration and keeping the team taught model in English and social studies at DHS. And thank you all for all of your hard work this year. Have a good thank day. You, thank you, Mrs. Latham. Username Music Mac, you are unmuted and recognized. Mr. 
Does anyone on a computer that they know from a family perspective might be under the name Music Mac? Or yeah. we need to move on. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you if you can identify yourself and your address. Thank you. You are, seem to be muted again. All right, we'll give it one more try. Working now? Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Kevin Bannerton. I live at 57 Rettlehan Road, and I have two sons at Darien High School, one senior and one freshman diver on the boys' swim and dive team. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening and to voice my opposition to the one section of the proposed budget, specifically the allocation of resources under the athletic department. Uh, let me first state that I do recognize that within the budget, you're trying to strike a balance among a range of priorities and includes both discretionary and non-discretionary items. And when there are discretionary budget cuts under consideration, however, I believe it is reasonable to expect that the board will seek to apply those cuts in an equitable manner. Uh, my concern is that under the current proposal, parents from a few athletic teams that require the use of outside facilities, including the boys and girls swimming and diving, would bear disproportionate costs when compared to other sports. Uh, not notwithstanding the fact that the 70-30 ratio between the parent share and the Board of Education share seems arbitrary and may have some implications with respect to Title IX, implementation of that policy is impractical based on the way the budget categorizes certain sports. Uh, for example, the, uh, the boys and girls divers are separated out from the boys and girls swimming and dive teams when, as Tara Worm mentioned, they do compete as one team with all points counting toward uh, the meets. To highlight an extreme example of the budget and how, it, how the process works under the proposal, for example, the $5,500 rental fee for the boys' diving facilities would be divided just between two families, requiring each to fund 70% or $1,925 each just to participate on the team. And that would be like asking the place kicker or punter on the football team to pay for the team's uniforms or equipment. So any budget proposal that has the effect of placing a higher financial burden on a few individual team members, much less a limited number of teams across the uh, athletic department seems flawed. So I hope this example just highlights some of the inequity of the targeted expense cuts. And I ask the board to consider um, rejecting this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banton. Username Carrie Oldenbrough. You are unmuted and right. Is it Oldendorf Carriers? Is that what you unmuted? Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's me. My name is Karen Christensen from Nine Windsor Road, and I would like to state my opposition to the proposal to include the swim teams in the 3070 redistribution of rental facility fees across the board. I think I can offer a unique perspective on the topic of swim, dive, and Darianne. We moved to Darianne in 2006 when my oldest daughter was only two. Yeah. I remember clearly reading the local news about the brand new high school and the decision to cut the pool from the building plan. At the time, I thought it was very short-sighted to make a cut like that and thought for sure it would be rectified by the time my kids were in high school. We moved out of Darianne and were away for the past five years and only returned this past summer. My daughter is now a junior in high school and currently being recruited to swim in college. If I had known all that I know now, we may have thought twice about that move back. When you don't have the ability to train, compete, and get official times at your high school pool, you seriously diminish your recruiting opportunities. The board needs to decide if they're going to have a varsity swim and dive team or not. If so, these students should be treated like any other student athlete that represents the school at the varsity level. You may not know that year round swimmers pay hefty fees to hold their spot in club swimming so that they can represent Darien High School during swim season. I can't help but make comparisons from the swim program we came from and the one offered at Darien High. The school profited from having their own pool where they could host meets and varsity swimmers had the same respect as any other varsity sport. Meets were attended by students and faculty and there was a strong sense of school spirit as, as a result. 
My daughter had almost double the amount of pool time, yet had a much easier schedule as she was able to stay at school for swim and for dry land. The amount of driving around to accommodate borrowed pool time here is very difficult to manage. We had a young team this year and a lot of kids don't drive. Swim times in the afternoon were moved up and it became impossible to arrive to practice on time from school, thus further decreasing the amount of already limited pool time they had. Morning practice ran from 5.20 a.m. to close to 7 a.m. The girls had no ability to use the locker room to shower and had to get to school by 7.40. Please note that swimmers also need to eat. If it were not for Marge and the amazing job that she does pulling this team together, I think most kids would just opt into staying at their club and skipping the high school season. They make tremendous sacrifices in order to represent DHS. I truly believe that without Marge band-aiding this program together, there would not be that time, Mrs. Christensen. Marge is the reason the girls go through with this. In short term, in the short term, swimmers and divers should not be paying rental costs for seriously subpar facilities that were a direct result of short-sightedness in building and investing in a proper swim program. The board needs to address the issues in the long term as well, in order to not allow 20 years to go by with no change in these conditions. Thank you so much for your consideration. Thank you, Mrs. Christensen. Username Kendall L. You are unmuted and recognized. Hi, my name is Susan Lukey and I live at 47 Echo Drive North. I want to start by thanking the Board of Education for all the time and effort that they are putting into this extremely complex budget. I am a parent of two swimmers on the girls varsity team. The, swim and the girls swim and dive team is a small team that fights and overcomes more obstacles than any other team at Darien High School. And each year it seems that more obstacles are thrown their way. Two years ago, it was determined that they could no longer practice or compete in the same location or even on the same day as a team because the diving board at the Di Darien YMCA, which was built in 1953, is not up to code and no longer considered safe. Can you imagine the football team playing one half of their game on one day with part of the team in one location and the other half of the team on another day with, the, with other team members in a different location? I can't. Well, unfortunately for the girls swim and dive team, this is how they are used to competing. This year, the season started for the girls swim and dive team with the video being produced by the Darien Athletic Foundation that was widely distributed as a fall sports preview saying that volleyball was the only fall indoor sport. Volleyball isn't the only fall indoor sport. Swimming and diving was completely forgotten. Could you imagine if it was lacrosse that had been forgotten out of a spring preview? I can't. The girls were also told that they were limited to the number of swimmers that could be in the pool at any given time. As a result, six swimmers from the team could only practice three mornings a week before school and on Sunday mornings. They could not practice after school with the rest of the team. This is a grueling schedule and not fair to these girls that they do not get to practice as a team and only have a limited practice schedule due to an antiquated facility. If the girls were able to practice in an updated eight lane facility, similar to other FCAC teams, this would not have been an issue. The list goes on and on, but with only three minutes, instead of focusing on obstacles, let's focus on what they have accomplished. Last year, they were FCAC champions and the only state champions at Darien High School. They had four All-American swimmers, which is a tremendous accomplishment for a small team of 36. They have broken school records over the past few years and have sent many swimmers to compete at Division I and Division III colleges. This is a team that works hard and deserves more, not less. It is not fair that they are already making the best of a terrible situation and one that possibly may not be in compliance with the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights Settlement. Does it need to be made worse by asking the team to fund practicing at the New Canaan YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club when it is not their choice, but they have no other option? Perhaps it should be looked into but whether- you're almost at time. Perhaps it should be looked into whether a pool could be put into the high school or somewhere else that is up to today's standards and they would have a facility that would be equal to what other teams have. The tennis team has beautiful new courts and the turf fields are beautiful to name a few. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Bucky. Username Jamie Zionic, you are unmuted and recognized. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, uh, this is Jamie Zionic at 15 Homes Court, speaking for Darian CPAC. Um, I think this is probably the first time that um, Darian CPAC is requesting that you cut the special education budget RC24 by $146,586, uh, the proposed Board of Education budget, I should say, um, and reject the separate position of special education assistant principal. Uh, we urge you to preserve the resources for yet to be known expenses related to COVID educational recruitment. Um, the current proposal is problematic for many reasons. I could speak for uh, more than three minutes on this, but um, uh, to start with, it's not inclusive. Um, educate, uh, educating children is a shared responsibility. The U.S. Department of Education Office of Special Education and Rehabilitation Services communicates that ensuring all children, including children with disabilities, um, are held to rigorous academic standards and high expectations, the shared responsibility for all of us. How will the general education principals and general education assistant principals contribute to a sense of belonging for all children if they aren't involved in their education? Um, the PPT must have a representative of the school district who is knowledgeable about the general education curriculum. All students, including those receiving special education services are general education students. We do not believe a special education assistant principal would be qualified to meet the requirements. While backgrounds in areas such as school psychology are valuable, the school designee must make sure that annual IEP goals are aligned with the state academic content standards for the grade in which a child is enrolled. Separate is, isn't equal. Would the district or any other create separate assistant principals for any other group of students? I, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ayana. There are no more raised hands at this time. Okay, we'll give a minute. Um, as I said earlier, when we got started, many people emailed uh, that they want to be on the list to speak. It's very different this year being remote. So if there, are anyone, if there is anyone else out there that would like to speak at the public hearing on the 2021-2022 superintendent's proposed budget, please raise your hand. All right, I thank all of you that have uh, joined us this evening and uh, spoken, we appreciate it. If you could send in your comments to the Board of Ed, uh, that would be appreciated. And thank you for your time and all the work and efforts that you put in into uh, looking at, reviewing and spending time on the budget this year. Thank you very much. Are we good, Michelle? Yes, we have no more raised hands, Mr. Denis. Thank you so much, Michelle, for all your efforts. You're welcome. We will move on now to further review of the 2021-2022 superintendent's proposed budget. Um, I think in the interest of time and staying organized, we will work through the spreadsheet that was organized from our last meeting in terms of feedback by board members as to items they wanted to look at and discuss. Um, so if everyone is ready to start um, at the top of that list, RC1, I will look for, I will look for hands. <laughs> RC1, uh, Darien High School English teachers uh, restore the 0 0.80 FTE for team teaching. Uh, any further comment or questions on that? Mr. Maroney? No? Okay. He was thinking. Any further? I see, I don't see, I don't know if you can arrange this, Michelle. I don't see Dave Brown. Um, I don't see Tara. In terms of my visual, which would help. I think uh, it's just your visual, Duke, because I can see Dave and okay. Duke, hey. no, no comments on this one if I okay, have any. Dave, comments. there you go. I think you had to you had to speak to pop up, so thank you so much. I promise if I have comments, you'll know. Good, thank you. I'm sure everyone will, so I appreciate that. Okay, I see no comments or questions on that. Um, we'll move to RC25, health insurance, uh, benefits for English team teaching. Uh, any further questions or comments with respect to that? Uh, 
Okay. We will move back to RC1, Darien High School Social Studies teachers restore the point 80 FTE for team teaching. Any questions or comments with respect to that? Thank you. Uh, RC25, uh, health insurance. Uh, that is the benefits for the social studies of the team teaching. Any additional comments or questions on that? Thank you. RC1, uh, Darien High School, teacher aid, restores second library paraprofessional. Any comments or questions around that? Thank you. Yes, Mr. Dr. Adley. Uh, I just want to note that that probably would be taken as a package, I think. I think the intent of it is to be taken as a package uh, with the library media uh, being restored at the middle school under RC3. Because uh, uh, otherwise, uh, well, I'd like, I'd like just for clarification, I think if that's the intent, but I just want to be sure. Mrs. Ackman. So, Duke, that's my cut. Yes, the intention would be to restore. I guess I was going to wait until we got to um to the middle sex one to have a more robust conversation but we can do it here dr adley i'm concerned with our investment in libraries reimagined i know we touched on this during one um, of the early budget meetings but i'm concerned i'm not sure why we are taking away a library media specialist at the middle school given our large enrollment in the state and we're investing in library reimagines i, I need to know how that works. So we can either do it here, or Middlesex, dealer's choice. Uh, we, we, we can talk about it here. And uh, uh, so when, when we looked at it, I think one of our, our uh, parents just did a, uh, just mentioned the comparison across across the school district. And I, and I guess for New Canaan uh, being, the, being the main comparison there. Uh, we, it's, it's, again, it's a program that we feel that we can make the change. Yes, uh, having a, an additional person it's, it's always helpful and um, efficient to run it and with library reimagines or just libraries in general, uh, having two, two librarians uh, is, is useful for, for many of us who go to town libraries and so on and so forth. Uh, the staffing in those uh, would give you a comparison in terms of uh, how having two people or three people is helpful. Uh, again, um, I will say if this was once again a decision in terms of trying to advance some of our uh, programs that we're trying to do uh, for next year. This is one of those areas where uh, I felt in, in collaboration with, with our uh, administration that uh, we can make that change. That's... Mrs. Ackman. So I guess, I guess my question would be, respectfully, I need a little more than we can manage it. What are we, what are we trading? What are we losing? Um, what are we gaining? Clearly, I understand that it is a budgetary impact, but before we go cutting these FTEs and investing in libraries, I need to understand the plus minus. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the librarians do uh, some instructional uh, opportunities and certainly uh, some of the uh, tangential activities that, that were shared actually this evening by uh, a parent in terms of uh, whether it be the Middlesex uh, quiz bowl and so on and so forth, helping out in different areas. There, there will be less instructional time uh, with, with, the, with the kids in the library in that, in that form, that is true. But, but again, I think it's something that uh, we can manage. And, and, and I do use that, uh, that term deliberately. Mrs. Stein? Um, I think you sort of touched on it, but I am concerned. I didn't realize that the librarians were responsible at Middlesex for Quiz Bowl, Geography Beat. We know how robust and successful those programs are and how- um, I just want to clarify this and they're responsible for those, but, but, they, but they take place in the library and so that they help out and so on and so forth. They're not deliberately responsible for them directly. Okay. Mrs. Ackman. So I guess this is my question. Maybe before our ad cut and our final decision, we need to really understand what the responsibilities are, what the trade-offs are, so that when we vote, we know. Because 
Um, while I love relying on our parents telling us what they do, I think we as a board really need to understand when we're cutting this, what, what the effect is. And, and we may support it fully, um, or we may decide that that's not a cost we're willing to incur and we're willing to fund it um, because we're not particularly dialed down to any particular budget number. But I think we need to understand Just for some of these firms, which we really value. Okay. You froze there for a second, Mrs. Ackman. I don't know if you want to repeat your last sentence. I just think we need a more robust understanding but besides um, we can do it. Um, and we, we can't really rely on the parents letting us know what the responsibilities are. If the administration can provide us with the responsibilities so we understand the change and then should we choose to support it or we decide that we are willing to incur a budget increase because of it, we know exactly what the cost benefits are. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Any additional questions or comments? So I would say we covered the RC1 Darien High School Library Professional and RC3 Middle School Middlesex, Middlesex Middle School, we tore the Library Media Specialists. Duke, this is Jill. Can I just add on to the library, please? Sure. Um, Alan, when you come back to talk to us, will you please talk about um, how this dovetails with our, our vision for our libraries? Um, because I know we're taking a look at how our libraries function and this may be part of that overall look. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCammon. We will move on to RC1, Darien High School, Teachers of the Gifted, uh, Talented and Gifted at the High School. Any additional comments or questions on that? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to RC5, uh, Hinley, uh, Teacher's Aid, Restore Instructional Para. Any additional questions or comments on that? Mrs. Perrin. Thank you. I just, again, I, I've said this every every meeting about this so far, but I'm, I'm just really concerned about taking away student-centered support from our children. And I, Dr. Adley, I've heard you say a couple times that this is a decision that was made primarily due to financial gains that are, you know, we could, that this is a, seems like it's a, it's mainly driven by, by a financial decision. And I, um, again, to the, I guess, similar to the library, what are we losing by, by changing this? Um, is there any gain or is this purely a financially driven decision? Uh, so, so, part, so uh, in addition to looking for uh, the needs of the students, right, uh, they're not mutually exclusive uh, from looking for efficiencies where we can actually uh, realize those efficiencies. Our paraprofessionals play a tremendous role. Um, as I've said before, there are, there are often people who live in the community who are dedicated to the school system, love the kids, uh, help the teachers and do a, a tremendous job. They, they do a variety of things from particularly instructional uh, uh, paraprofessionals. They assist the, the teacher in the classroom. Uh, they're an extra set of hands in the classroom. They cover for classes. They cover for uh, PPTs. Uh, there, there is an option, a different option for covering for PPTs. And often they cover uh, for lunch. So you are losing, you are losing something. There. It's not just a simple trade-off uh, with the time because if they happen to be in, in the lunchroom uh, covering and we're having lunch monitors cover, yes, you, you regain some of that time. Uh, but I would say that you, you're, you're going to lose the presence of, of an instructional uh, paraprofessional. I'm not going to uh, describe it any other way than that. What's the, what's the correct number of, of paraprofessionals? Uh, th th I'm not sure that there is a correct number of, uh, of paraprofessionals. I would say, and I say this in the most respectful, the most respectful way, uh, research uh, I would tell you that uh, 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 effective teaching is not dependent on a paraprofessional. But again, if I were to ask all my, all my teachers, they would tell me different, right? They would tell me, I, I would like an elementary teacher would tell me I would, they would love a part of professional, so I respect that. Uh, but this is an efficiency that I think we can realize. And again, it's one of those ones that, that, that come along with uh, the concept of student support, and teacher support, so I, I recognize the um, dilemma that, that that poses. Mrs. Stein. So Alan, building on that, if, 
we get rid of the paras and we have the lunch monitors. In the cases where the paras were filling in for PPTs, lunches, absences, um, the lunch monitors won't be able to do that. So we will then have to back in subs. Is that, would that be realistic to say? That is, that is correct, yes. But then uh, it's not exactly a, you know, the, the savings isn't exactly a real number if you're gonna have to pay for subs to fill in for classes, I would say. So some of that will have to play out a little bit. Uh, you'd be right there, Katie, uh, in terms of just how that plays out, but uh, they should be, they should be, uh, they should be actually covered under another line item uh, for this, for this coverage for the subs for the PPTs, and we'll have to sort of uh, see how it plays out just financially. Mrs. McCannon, Alan, would you clarify that last point, please? Have you already built additional substitutes into the budget, or I didn't understand? Richard, could you just talk to that line item for me, please? The instructional powers don't substitute uh, for teachers. When the teachers are out, they put in for actual subs. Uh, so losing the instructional power doesn't have an impact on substitutes. But you're talking about coverage for PPTs, Jill, I think, are you? Well, I think that's one question that came up and yes. that you had mentioned that they cover. So what, how would that play out if uh, these teachers were in a, PPP, a PPT meeting? Well, the, the, the principals have said that they can work that out, um, but, they, but I believe, Richard, that there's another uh, opportunity for, for technically for, for paraprofessionals are not technically scheduled to cover for PPTs. Isn't that correct? Okay. And can you point out that the, where that line item comes from otherwise, just for reference? There's, there's substitute costs within RC24 for special education. So I'll keep it, I'll keep this open in that this conversation, just to, to recap, this conversation covers RC5 Henley, yes. RC7 Holmes, RC8 Ox Ridge, RC9 Royal, and RC10 Tokenique. It also covers RC25 for the health insurance costs. So again, um, for each of those RCs, it's restoring the instructional para and removing the lunch monitor and the subsequent effects of the benefits on the instructional para for health benefits. So I'll leave it open if there's any other questions because it does cover all five elementary school RCs. Any further discussion? Mrs. McCabin. So Alan, I know you've covered this a little bit, but just building on what Mrs. Parent was asking about the instructional role of a paraprofessional. Um, what do you really see as being, um, so that we can, I think, fully understand the implication of this. I'd like to understand, I know there's no science behind the exact right number, um, but what is really, what's an ideal para support structure look like? Tell me if that's too broad. Um, I don't think that there's an, I don't think that there's a perfect or an ideal one, Mr. McCammon. Um, certainly the, the younger the grade levels, uh, the younger the grade levels, I, I, would, I would say that the, the more inclination there is uh, for prior professionals, but sometimes it depends on the grouping of the classes um, in terms of the makeup classes of other as well uh, and the needs of the classes. So where there's a need, there may not be, uh, I think the video will find this happens now that, that uh, the principals have the autonomy to place it that the prior professionals where they feel the greatest need is. So I don't think that there is a, a perfect uh, scenario. Uh, Certainly helping out with organization and small groups at, uh, uh, for organizational purposes is, is very beneficial to, to teachers, particularly at the younger grade levels. But I don't think if there is a perfect, if I say to Mr. McCammon, uh, yes, it would be perfect to, for, for all kindergartners and all first grade classes to have paraprofessionals, that would seem like a, a reasonable answer back. Uh, but it's, it's, it, it, there's no perfect uh, a scenario. I would say the younger grade levels like in kindergarten, and you do have some districts uh, that would perhaps have a, have a policy for uh, a kindergarten level or, or first grade level, you, you, you would share a part professional half and half type thing, uh, you know, a half time professional for a kinder, each kindergarten class or something like that. So uh, I think the younger grade levels is where, where understandably they should reside for the most part. 
but at the at the end of the day, you've got a, a school with potentially 10 classrooms or 12 classrooms, depending on size of classes and size of grades. And you've got one para that's really dispatched by the substitute based on teachers coming to the principal stating a need for a day or a specific period of time throughout the day for their class. Well, sometimes that they're, they're assigned to a class permanently anyway, so, so it's not just a matter so of- So one para in one school could be assigned mm -hmm. to a class permanently. So yes. how, does that, how does that play out with the other teachers in that building? In other words, why, why this class and why not mine? Um, you're making my point, right? Um, okay. is that, that I think that, that there, there could be that a little bit and understanding mm -hmm. that, that people would understand that it could be like that. I think that, that, there can, that the management of this, this resides as a management level at the building that principal. If if there was a need for, for more paraprofessionals uh, at the elementary level, I would have thought with her, we would hear that coming through the budget process mm -hmm. and in a given year that, that there's a greater need for more for, for a particular strategy and approach. I think Clara has a question. Okay, Mrs. Ackman. So um, a couple points. Oh, wait, am I unmuted? Sorry, a couple points. I would just say, you know, we've seen, sometimes we use Paris for enrollment. You know, we, we've heard some enrollment concerns. Sometimes we have needed to use budget control for Paris. Um, and then that precludes us for using budget control in other areas. So I, that's part of the roles. Sometimes classes have a specific need which requires a para. Um, but Dr. Adley, can you talk a little bit, having your experience with lunch monitors this year, who takes this role? Is it a transient role? And, and really what I'm trying to get at is our, our pairs are known by the children throughout the school day. And so when they go into lunch, that's a known entity. And I'm just trying to understand who takes a lunch monitor role? Do they sign on for the full year? Is it possible that we have lots of different people as monitors throughout the year and or what's the vetting process for that? So I would say and I would recognize uh, to anyone who's on the call that uh, consistency of someone in a lunchroom uh, is ideal and actually consistency of a, of a staff member uh, and, and in this case maybe paraprofessionals who do it, that consistency is very, very helpful. One of the things that we learned actually through COVID and a little bit to my surprise is that we could get consistency uh, of people in uh, the lunchroom. There's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of our community members want to volunteer and I think that was tremendous and it was helpful, uh, but they tend to be transient in some ways and uh, have different people in different days. Uh, what we find is we were able to get, um, one of the fears that we had was when, when we put monitors in that we wouldn't be able to get them and we were really able to hire them. So the consistency of that approach uh, was helpful. Now, how long they will stay for uh, long-term, uh, but, uh, they certainly stayed long enough that, uh, since we have hired them that uh, that we could sort of test the waters a little bit and uh, we're ple pleasantly surprised, but there's a certainly a benefit of consistency. If I thought it was gonna just chop and change completely, uh, I don't think we'd move forward with it. So Duke, just a follow up. Um, a few years ago, some of us remember that the administration put in an administrative um, reg that precluded parents from coming in during the lunchroom. How does this juxtaposition with that administrative reg uh, regulation? I read about that. Yeah, I did too. <laughs> <laughs> I had Fox News in my door. We're always in the news. We're always in the news. I, 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 I don't think it's, I think they're sort of mutually exclusive to be honest with you. Um, uh, if I don't believe everything I read that are coming in for different purposes or spending time, this is actually supervision of the students, completely supervision of the students. So it's not, that, forgive me if I'm not recalling it correctly, but it's not for coming in for lunch and spending time with the kids and so on and so forth. It's strictly for supervision in here. So it's, it's just a different thing. And that's, actually that's not really opening that up again, to be honest with you. Um, it's, a, it's just a, it's a different purpose as my understanding. Certainly what I'm talking about is strictly supervision for that lunch time. So no, I just want to make sure that the board doesn't, doesn't change inadvertently administrative regulations. So yeah, I think what Tara is trying to say is we're not allowing parents in their own children's lunchroom to be lunch monitors. That a fair I think statement. That would have to be. I think that good good question, good comments. I think that would have to be part of the the screening and the hiring process because I think that well, we have a, a regulation in place that does not allow parents in their own children's lunchrooms. Right. So that would preclude them from the hiring process. Sorry, Marjorie, I couldn't hear you. 
Right. I'm sorry. I will confirm there are no parents who are lunch monitors at all, and certainly we wouldn't allow it in the, their child's school. Thank you, Mrs. Sion. Mrs. McCammon. So just looking overall at an elementary school building, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we have a lot of support. We've got student interns and two building substitutes, and we have instructional pairs. Um, Alan, um, when you, perhaps when you come back to us next time, can you talk about how that, that cohort works together? Um, because how, I think- How the cohort work, Jill? Yeah, that, that we've, we've got a lot of different ways that, that we have support in the buildings. And I think it's important that, yes, we want to talk about paras um, specifically as a role, but also understanding that we have multiple ways that we cover PPTs, substitute needs, um, filling in for classrooms. So I'd love to understand how those groups work together and provide support as, with a, from a sort of a holistic perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCammon. Any other further questions on the conversation related to the RCs to the elementary schools on the uh, lunchroom monitors and the parent instructional paras? Okay, thank you all. Moving on, um, RC 11, um, athletics, uh, interscholastic, fee for girls swimming, uh, we can look at all three of these together from a conversation standpoint, RC11, uh, fee for girls swimming, RC11, uh, fee for girls diving, and RC11, fee for boys diving. So I'll open it up. Mr. Sini. Thanks, Duke. Um, I was the individual who added this proposed cut um, in the hopes of you know, uh, creating a broader discussion over equity surrounding the 70-30 sports policy. But when I, first of all, when I look at the cut to the three line items, it amounts to 15,500, 15,500. But based on my comments and I rewatched them today, the intended proposal for that amount was 70% of that to put it in line with the 70-30 or 10,850. So there's a, I, sorry, Rich, I wasn't that clear when I was, uh, you know, it, proposing this line item. Um, but subsequent to that agenda item, when we went through the uh, ad cuts, we uh, discussed the upcoming master agenda. And uh, we have a lot of the topics that were raised during public comment this evening um, are gonna be added uh, or were added in that master agenda item that we, we uh, brought up uh, in that subsequent agenda item. So Again, I kind of broke the rule that I always raise that I injected a policy discussion into the budget uh, process. Um, but uh, I will be taking this out or, I mean, I propose that we eliminate it and uh, based, but based on the number of public, thoughtful public comments this evening, I really look forward to a more robust uh, future discussion over these items. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Any additional questions or comments, Mrs. Ritchie? Thanks. Hi. Just based on some of the questions we heard this evening, I would just request, and it doesn't have to be for next week, but I do, I would like to see in the future budgets that we do break that down, um, the sports like squash and skiing and sailing, that we make sure we do have a girls and boys breakdown so we understand what our total female population and male population is. And I have seen other districts actually present girls and boys sports separately. So I think administration should also consider that as we move ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. Um, I think there'll be further discussion down the road on uh, while we've gotten a lot of reporting over the last couple of years and a lot more reporting. I think what we've learned through some of these conversations is there may be some other ways that we need this information reported and broken down. So we'll We'll look to have those conversations in the future. Uh, Duke, yeah. Duke, I just want to add, I think that um, it's important that boys and girls swimming are seen as one team. I think most of the board recognizes that. Uh, the accounting may look different, but for everyone um, listening, they are one team. They compete for the same points. Um, you couldn't be winning state championships without a dive team. Um, so I think that's important. And I, and I think... Should we have a further discussion? We're going to need to go back and clarify some of this history. You know, the Board of Education never precluded yeah. a pool. Um, that was a building committee decision out of our control. So 
I think should the board choose to have a larger discussion on this, we can help correct some of the record, but maybe we should consider in the budget and, and Rich, this is no fault of your own. It's It's been broken out this way for a few years now. We should look at swim and dive. They are one team, they, they, they happen together. Um, I thought the analogy of the kicker on a team was was a powerful one. And so we should uh, we should maybe look at adjusting that or at least speaking of it as one team because it truly is one team at the high school. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mr. Brown. Just to follow up to that, um, to Rich, are we going to be accounting on the books instead of the barter? We're actually going to have those numbers represented going forward? Uh, you mean with the YMCA? Yes, sir. Point of order, I'm sorry, but that's, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that is not part of our budget discussion and we should table that for another time. But the YMC, YMCA agreement is should be discussed at another time. So let's take that off the table, please. I'm sorry, but we've had numerous conversations about transparency, asking for sports to be broken down, shown in various different ways, boys versus girls, one team, another team. I don't see why transparency here is an issue. And I don't understand why I should be precluded from following up with that question. I think yes, Mr. Brown, Mr. Mr. Brown, no, I, I appreciate the question and we need further conversation on that. I think this evening is to get through these specific line items that were brought up. I do agree that is an accounting issue that we have to address and I think we'll have further conversation around it. And if you could, any specific questions relative to that, if you could direct them to me so we can get them answered and get them part of the discussion. Are you all right with that? Thank you, sounds good. Thanks, Mr. Brown. Any further questions on um, RC11? I think we can move forward. Thank you all very much for the conversation. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Mrs. Parent, sorry. I have a question. I'm just gonna move on to the intramurals at, at elementary before we shut this RC down. Um, I just wanna understand the uh, implications that if this cut goes through, what happens at the other four elementary schools with their intramurals that from what I understand now is run through Darien after school? Okay, so we're moving on to that RC, Mrs. Perrin. So uh, let me just call that RC and I might ask you to repeat that question. So we're moving on to RC 11 athletics, intramurals, elementary school, the $10,329. I believe that's, is that specific to an elementary school? Yes, it's one elementary well, it's, yeah. It is, but that, that's where it's happened at one elementary school. One elementary school. All right, Mrs. Perrin, could you repeat that question, please? I just would like to understand the implications that if this um, this intramurals, which is happening at Holmes, what does that mean for the other intramurals at the other four schools that are currently being run by Darien After School? I remember reading something somewhere that there would be some implication. I just want to make sure that that's clarified. So I understand. Thank you, Mrs. Parent. I know also, Dr. Adley, last night at the RTM Education Committee meeting, there seemed to be questions and confusion as to where there are intramurals in the elementary schools and why this only falls into one school. And it got into a conversation about equity amongst the elementary schools. So I know you have some information around that in terms of the ability for these schools to have intramurals, but it's also a staffing issue. It, 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 really, it really is a staffing issue. The intramurals are at homes. If we take this out, we're taking out intramurals. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't propose that we actually uh, take take them out. Uh, it is offered every year, and uh, the, the teachers, for whatever reason, at homes uh, tend to be the ones we actually uh, volunteer to uh, run the intramurals. The other ones are run as accurately as we as being relayed by Darien uh, after school program. Um, and if if we did run it through Darien after school program, if, if a staff member wanted to to take it. Uh, they would have to take it through you know, the DEA contract. So uh, I would not propose a uh, removal this. So just to be clear, all the elementary schools have the ability to have the intramurals. Yes. Holmes is the one that seems organized and has the staffing to do it. The other schools do it through the after school program. Yeah, no one is, there's no one who's actually uh, taking the lead on it, but would, would actually like to do it, yes. Okay. So if any of the other elementary schools organized themselves and had the staff to do it, they would have intramurals at that elementary yes. school. Okay, all right, just so kind of we level set with everyone, um, kind of the facts around it. Mrs. McCammon. So 
Uh, would you please clarify how many schools actually run intramurals? I know we have some after school programs that are distinct from intramurals and I'm not, it's not my understanding though. I would love to, I would love to know whether I'm right or wrong. It is not, how many of our elementary schools actually do run intramurals is my first question. And then my second question, my, my second question is um, if it is the case that if somebody organized it, we had to, we would have to run it. Is is that a true statement? Meaning that if all the other four elementary schools, assuming assuming it's only one, uh, that may be wrong. But if only if the other four decided all of a sudden we have to run it, do we then have to add an additional forty thousand dollars to the budget? No, well, we would we would we would run uh, something at the other schools if, if they if they sign if they signed up for it. So, so just to Jill, if I could piggyback on that, so the ten thousand three twenty nine. Is that the specific costs associated with running the intramural? Yeah, I, I think that's the entire. No, that's, that's the allocation for uh, if you were to run it at all five schools. So that account is always under budget because only Homes has run it with a Darien Public School employee. If we were to eliminate intramurals uh, and cut this line item, we would not be allowed to have Darien after school run intramurals because it would be considered contracting out bargaining unit work. Uh, so we couldn't have like the four schools use Darien after school and homes, which is currently using uh, Darien public school employees. So if it's cut, it's cut across the board. So following up on that, Mr. Rudel, and to me, it just the way I look at things, why wouldn't that cost be in all the RCs and just shown as not being used and being transferred at the end of the year? Like just, I think it does beg the question, is there an equity issue? It looks like one school is spending $10,000 on an intramural program and the other four schools are not. Is it just the way it's always been accounted for? So it's always been reflected in RC 11. Um, that Homes is not spending 10,000, it's roughly about 2,000 is what they're spending. And then okay. the other represents the, what's not spent at the other four schools. So it's just how it's been rolled up from a budget process. Right. So if you wanted to delineate it and push it out into RC five through 10, um, we certainly could. And what you would see is that the four schools, it would be a budget with no expenditures against it. And then at home, right. it would be a budget with the expenditures. Against right, it. thank you for that clarification. Mrs. Ackman. So it's, <clears throat> sorry, it's, it's a stipended position within the budget. So it's resided in homes because homes is the only one that has taken advantage of it. So at the moment, it looks as if they have the whole budget. However, I don't know that anyone's running a $10,000 intramural budget. So I just think that we need to be aware of both the contract and the implications of doing this. The other schools have chosen a different way. However, it's a, a contractual agreement. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. McCammon. So Alan, can we just distinguish? I know that each of the five elementary schools offers something beyond the, uh, the school day, um, but it is not my, how many schools actually run intramurals? I think the, uh, uh, the only thing is, what is, is homes are an AM program. I think flag football is, is it at this point, or has been it. Thank you. So Rich, just a little, um, a little history here. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to open the budget book. So last year, was this a similar amount and was it just only drawn down for the cost associated with the homes program and the rest was swept and used else, elsewhere? Correct, yep. Okay, thank you. Mr. Sini. So just so I'm clear for the accounting, we over budget in this one line, one line item, and then it's distributed to other schools and ultimately spent, or are we consistently under budget on this line item? So the budget stays in RC 11. We don't allocate, we allocate it to the schools. So we budget assuming all five, because all five have the opportunity to run it, we'll run it. Um, but historically only homes has run it. So you essentially have, you know, roughly $8,000 that just goes unspent and then at the end of the year it gets returned to the town or it's a transfer. So for fairness or equity, we're budgeting for every school, but in reality, the budget, those dollars aren't spent. And typically, if you go back the last five years, right. what at three quarters, if not 80% are returned. Correct. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Mrs. Sion. 
Well, I, I just want to be clear that every year we post for an intramural coordinator at each of the five schools because the only reason we could run the run things through Darien after school is if no bargaining unit member took the stipend. So we do offer it to everyone every year. I think that's why we've been budgeting the full amount. So the pieces continue to come together. Thank you with all the pieces. Mrs. McCammon had her hand up. Okay, Mrs. Ackman. Um, I was gonna say what Mrs. Sion said, but she said it much better. Thank so. you, Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. Ritchie. So just to be clear, the other schools do have similar programs, but they are running them through Darien after school. But there are programs, yes. is that correct? Yes. Okay. Because I saw someone shaking their head, so I just want to make sure. So, so there's no bargaining a unit member at the other schools that wishes to be the intramural coordinator. With that, we are allowed to contract out to outside contractors or the PTOs can. Should we not offer it, we can't contract it out because bargaining unit members must be offered the ability first. So you almost have to budget for it unless you'd like to kill intramurals at the elementary school or end them, sorry, kill is the wrong word. So I think just to close the loop there, because I think we've got all the pieces. So to that point, if it's offered and not accepted and contracted out, how does that get paid for Mr. Rudel? So if it's contracted out, it's paid for by Darien After School. And then we charge Darien After School a building rental uh, fee, which that revenue is then reflected in RC12. Okay, thank you. Mrs. McCabot. Sorry, one more question. Um, so I, just to be clear, so it's, is, is it just intramurals? Can we, could we rent the space to Darien After School or whomever, Wingspan, whomever, uh, if they weren't running intramurals or is it does because I, I think that we have organizations who run programs that are not intramurals and so I'm not clear over whether it's the use of the space or whether it's the running of intramurals and I th think that makes a difference. So Darren after school does run other programs besides intramurals uh, in the schools, which we do charge a building rental fee and that revenue is collected and shown in RC12. They do, however, uh, run intramurals. I don't know if it's at all four schools. Um, I don't believe before this year they were at Oxridge, so it's probably not at Oxridge, uh, but they do offer other programs besides intramurals. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rudolph. All right, any further questions around that? If anything, I think we've all been educated on it. Thank you. Um, moving on, RC12, maintenance, consultant services, eliminating uh, the building condition study, $216,000. Any additional questions or comments around that? All right, speak up if I miss you. Thank you. Uh, RC I'll, I'll speak up. <laughs> okay, Mr. Uh, Dr. Adley. Uh, I think the actual, Number now is closer to uh, 130. Maybe Rich, you could sort of uh, confirm that for me. But I just want to make sure that we, if, if it remains off, what are we using to predict what we need for the maintenance and upkeep of the buildings? And it, it just concerns me that Mike has a, a, a tremendous institutional knowledge and, and ability, but it, that just concerns me. As a, as a, Richard, is it closer to 130 or? So we did reach out to three different vendors. Uh, we got a quote for about 230, 130, and then 125. Rich, anything at a high, high level? Uh, why such a spread? So the two that were towards the 125 and 130 have done work in Darien in the past, um, extensive work in Darien in the past. And so part of that historical knowledge um, kind of plays, in, plays the role in the price. Uh, no matter what ends up happening, we would have to put it out to bid given the threshold of the study. Right, thank you. So I'm just noting for the board, it's just a concern in the complete elimination of it. Okay, but it's nice that uh, Rich did some homework and we've got kind of a range of pricing associated there. Thank you. Okay, uh, RC15 technology, new computer equipment, um, eliminate first grade displays, any additional comments or conversation around that? Mrs. Parent. Can you just remind us as to where they are in their lifespan and if they if these do get cut, does how 
how greatly is the impact on the classes? Are the classroom teachers still going to be able to use them as the, as they do this year, or just how how dire is the need? So these are about fifteen years old, uh, so they're running out of the software that, that goes with it. They're not used in the same capacity as uh, the boards that, uh, that that we're talking about here. Uh, and, and honestly, we, we deferred these smart boards. Uh, we are we deferred we deferred these uh, silent boards um, last year. Uh, so it, I'm just it concerns me that we're deferring it again. So I would I would I'd strongly advocate that we keep this up. Our our technology is something that we need to, to continue to promote uh, use. This just this just this this doesn't uh, keep it going. Um, ideally, it'd be lovely to have uh, K two, uh, but certainly having the, uh, the first grades because. What we're talking about is a different between a smart board and, and the, uh, the board that we're on right here in, in the office. It's a computer on top of it. Uh, so instructionally, uh, we're losing out there and uh, there's not going to be any, there's not going to be any upkeep of those boards if, if they go down completely. So uh, they're 15 years old and it's, it's, it's just, it's just trying to get another year out of them. But um, I would strongly suggest that we don't because it was in the budget for last year again. Mrs. Ritchie. So just for clarification, Dr. Adley, you said we deferred them last year, but I don't recall as a board deferring them. Was that something that the administration did or did I forget that the board deferred? Well, maybe, maybe, maybe I forgot, Mrs. Ritchie, that it was us who actually deferred it. <laughs> if it wasn't on the list last year, I thought it was on the list last year. Maybe my memory fades me in that regard. Uh, was it on the list? I may have forgot. I may have forgot. No, the, the administration I, deferred it. Yeah, with the ministry, they didn't even get that far. My apologies to the board, but but it was deferred by us too at the, at the time. I, I would strongly advocate that we would keep that. Okay. Thank you for the correction, Ed. All right, continuing on the same conversation, RC15 technology, new computer equipment. Um, note, eliminate non-classroom teacher desktop replacements, $10,065. Mrs. Ritchie. So I'll just speak on this and the reason I did this was not because I'm, I guess what I'm hoping for is that we can find a device that comes in at a lower price and get it to everybody because I don't think we're going to be giving uh, desktop computers to our teachers anymore and it would make sense to find a more efficient way to deliver this potentially to everybody but I, I, I just want to it's sort of my flagging it to make sure that we're really efficient when we're looking at purchasing these things and not over purchasing things getting the best price, finding the right device at the right cost. And this sort of goes to iPads as well, because um, I did have a reduction for the iPads also. I think in the long run, we really need to take a look at what's going on at the high school. Are they using these devices? Should we make it an opt-in program at some point? Because I know a lot of people that have, they have their iMacs and they don't open up their iPads. So I, I don't want our taxpayers to fund a bunch of iPads that are gonna sit off to the side and not be used. So I really want the technology department to take a hard look at what we're spending on technology and make sure that we're delivering the best we can for our students and our taxpayers. Thank you. All right, so that also covers uh, RC15 new computer reduced 24 iPads. So any additional conversation or comments around that? Mr. Ritchie, can I, can I just clarify, just because I just wonder where that leads us in terms of, I hear you and I, I appreciate it. I think, um, Deb, I think you're talking about that uh, you're not suggesting that um, non-classroom teachers uh, don't get them replaced, but I hear you saying just to take a closer look at, at the actual purchase price for these as opposed to the proposal that's here. Is that right? Right. I know when, I know when it was proposed that the, the price was, I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but it came in as a desktop and I don't I, I don't know that it's really something that the teacher should be having anymore. I think we should be looking at a laptop or an iPad or something else that can get them what they need in terms of a device, but just giving a, a more efficient and more economical delivery where we're still getting the product that our teachers need, but we're, we're looking at what other options are out there. So that's sort of why I put that on there. Thank you. I think I could mean that. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Mrs. McCammon. So 
It's a question for Deb. Deb, is this, a, are you looking for a, a budget cut or are you looking for them to review their strategy on what type of devices they deploy? Well, I'm looking for a budget cut and the, and then, and as we move ahead, especially when it comes to the iPads, I really want us to take a close look at how we're budgeting, why we're choosing these devices and specifically at the high school, are they working? Are students actually using the device? Are they being integrated? And can, is an iMac, you know, just for example, is an iMac going to work with our curriculum? Can our students use that and still participate in everything that they need to? So I think for me, it's just a broader discussion that happens outside of the budget process as well. And I think Mrs. Ritchie, your, one of your concerns too is the use of desktop versus having something mobile as we go in and out of various uh, hybrid, remote and in-person learning a desktop just does not seem to make much sense nowadays. No, not at all. So I really think that we have to be very thoughtful when we select the device we're gonna give our classroom teachers. Thank you. Uh, we'll keep moving RC16 administration consultant services, eliminate demography report for enrollment projections. I'll look for any board comments or questions. And Dr. Adley or Mr. Rudel, any additional information around that? Uh, I would just say that uh, if it comes to the 16 round, right? We are. Uh, this, if it just comes to this, I will say in my past, I'm used to do, to doctoring the, 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 the numbers um, for better or for worse. However, it does, it does come at a wee bit of a price in the sense of the various grade level transitions, particularly between eighth and ninth, for for students who may uh, make a transition to private school, uh, the homes, uh, the, the, the sort of the inclusion of, of new homes and uh, families in homes, and also kindergarten. Those are three big uh, three big areas. We also have this is a, this is also a COVID year, uh, so making that change, we just won't get to the level of detail back and analysis back that, that, that this board I think is accustomed to in terms of the questions that are asked, uh, the research that it, that it looks for. We just won't be able to provide it at that level, but, but I'm anticipating that, that, we, that we know that. Okay. Mrs. Ackman. Um, so I think this is down as my cut, although I don't think it was, but I, I would support it. I think my question would be, is we had a full demography report this year. I think the, the unknown is the building projects for which we would not be proposing. We're not, we're not looking at that. We're not doing that sort of study because we've already done it. So we've had an in-house projection that has been fairly accurate. And I certainly am not opposed to demography studies, but I think the board needs to consider whether this is the best way year after year to be spending money, $10,000 is not um, overly impactful to our budget, but I think on a rolling basis, is this what we really need to do annually or can we rely on our current practices and maybe look at every other year or every third year? So un unless I heard that this demography do study is doing something unique, um, I would support cutting this from the budget because I, I don't know that we need to do it every year and we haven't so far, so I would need to understand the change in practice. Mrs. McCavin. I understand Mrs. Ackman's point and I, I don't disagree philosophically. Um, I just, I have two questions I think the board should consider uh, when we, when we you know, make a final decision. And one is that uh, we should have some census data was my understanding and that that would be a little bit more accurate. And the second is we are looking at the possibility of open gov in the next, excuse me, open choice in the next two years. And I think that we need to do accurate enrollment modeling uh, with that. Um, and I, I think that's an important component of, of understanding the full programmatic implications of that decision. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McCammon. All right, any further questions? We'll move along RC18 personnel, classroom teacher, add second teacher in residence to that program that we're looking at. Any additional conversation or discussion there? Thank you. Uh, scream if I'm moving too fast. RC18 personnel, dues and memberships. Just lost my glasses. Uh, that is the uh, ad for the CREC partnership fee for a second teacher. So any additional conversation or questions on that program? And then RC25, 
is the health insurance associated with that. So I think we're good. Mrs. McCammon. Marge, do you have any data about um, the candidate pool for that program? No, they um, have just begun to advertise it and it won't close until probably next month. Marge, just a quick follow-up question. Um, the, the schools that do it, is there any data out there that most of the schools have two, have one, have three? Is there any information as to what works best? I think you did a good job in explaining it that it's nice to have two um, in terms of them kind of forming their own bond and friendship as they go through the program. Right, so CREC uh, recommends two, but I will check and see. Uh, the website doesn't, it tells the participating districts, but not how many um, they have, but I can follow up on that. Thank you. We'll keep moving RC18, personnel budget control, reduce budget control from four to two. Teachers, any additional comments or thoughts? Mr. Sini. Thank you. Um, since it came up at public comment, one, one thing that the administration provided us, but uh, I calculated out was the use of budget control over the last four years. So just so uh, the facts are out there, in fiscal year 18, we use 31.7%. In fiscal year 19, 42.4%. Fiscal year 20, 0%. Fiscal year 21 was 100%. Um, but the, remember that budget control line was reduced by half in the budget revision process. So it was actually was 50% of the original budget that we had set. So when I normalized for last year, and just to take a straight average, we've used less than 33% of budget control over the last four fiscal years. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Mr. Maroney. Yeah, to build on Mr. Sini's point, um, there, there, I've seen some, some uh, announcements and, and documentation about the budget control and how last year that impacted Ox Ridge's class sizes. And I would just ask Dr. Adley to refresh my memory because I don't recall that being a budget control item as opposed to being a COVID related item. Uh, but, it was, but it's such, whether it was, well, in some ways, whether it was COVID or whether it was budget related, it, it still was, was a, a staffing matter. Uh, we, we used our two, uh, our two uh, budget control items uh, up and we didn't have any, we didn't have a, an additional uh, section there uh, in the budget control. So we, we had to add uh, a paraprofessional in. So, uh, I mean, if I needed, if, if, if Derek, I think Karen wants to say something. Well, you, you were finishing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So we so we did yes, we did we did use the two, um, and some of those were used also for um, uh, special education paraprofessionals uh, that were needed in the budget. Uh, so in any given year, you're going to, you're going to use it for those things. We have about four sections right now that are on tip. You heard you heard a, a comment tonight. Um, in the enrollment, we have about four sections that are really close to tipping right now, uh, and that's it, even without discussing about COVID sections, which we haven't got to yet. That will be later on here in the discussion. Uh, so if, if it was a year to do it at all, considering uh, that I, I would say that I wouldn't say this was a year to do it. Um. Mrs. Ackman. So Oxridge's last year was due to a raise in enrollment in August. They had over enrollment that came after we set sections. So it was not COVID unless we want to say that we had, you know, people move in because of COVID. They, the concern by parents that I think this whole board felt was, or, or heard, is that they felt that they had too many children and they were not at optimal level. But that was not, we did not add a para because of COVID in that class. We added it because those class sizes got large. So it is not in our COVID expenses, that para. It was taken directly out of budget control. We don't list it. It is not part of our special appropriation that we are going for. Um, I do think it's it's hard to normalize for last year. You know, it'd be I don't know that the the administration could answer this, but would we have added more teachers? Would we have broken more? Would we at this point be using our budget rather um, than COVID going back for a COVID appropriation? I feel pretty strongly that budget control we um, is 0.27 percent of our budget. We have returned money when we need to. We have said that this is the flexibility that we need. 
I think we, you know, we heard some concerns about classes breaking in public comment. This is exactly why we have this, that if something changes, we can adjust correctly for it. And then if we don't use it, we return it to the town. So um, I know there are differing opinions. That's, that's why we have a board of nine, but this is something I will strongly support in the budget. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. Ritchie? Just to um, add to the, those comments, I think in another year, if I didn't see four sections pretty close to tipping and breaking into another section uh, or for um, schools having that possible break, I think I would potentially consider a budget, look at budget control. But at this point, we have four of those um, potential breaks happening in our budget. And I think it would it's more prudent and it's actually more fiscally responsible for us to have that flexibility and hire those teachers when we need to, which is in August and not have to worry, are we gonna have the funds down the road to make sure that these teachers can be in place? We need to be able to hire them in August. And I think this gives us the ability to, to, to do that. I think it's a great budgetary tool. And like I said, in, in future years, if we don't see those four potential breaks, then I might be up for discuss, discussing a potential reduction. But at this point in this year and this proposed budget, I really think we need the four sections. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. All right, thank you. Uh, moving along, uh, RC24, special education, contracted occupational therapy, restoring uh, the variance year over year. Any other conversation or discussion around that? All right, uh, Mrs. McCammon. I just wanted to understand what is meant by restoring the variance exactly. Are you just going back to last year's? I think this was you, Terry. Yes, I believe there was a $10,257,000 decrease year over year. So the goal was just to restore it to the same dollar amount. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, I think Jill asked, Jill, did you need clarification on that cut? Or on that ad? Sorry. Yeah. What? Well, what? Also, what was if, if you had something that was driving it beyond just the dollar amount? Sure, I've gone back and I've looked at our transfers. We we um, these two lines are lines that we continually transfer into year after year, um, and I think that often, as we've looked at our special education reports, these are two areas in which um, we see increased needs. So, um, given that all IEPs are not completed for the year, I thought it and and as as you've noted yourself. Um, that there might be some special education needs that we need to um, plan for. I thought rather than worrying about transfers, restore to last year um, and, and use that as a starting point. Thank you, Mrs. Dockman. So that kind of rolled into the second RC24 and physical therapy, which was also to restore the variance, which was 7,589. So I'll keep that open for a moment. Any additional questions or comments on that? Okay. Is, uh, Dr. Adler. Is uh, Ms. Klein there? Mrs. Klein was there. Yeah. Mrs. Klein, could you speak to the need for this or, or lack thereof, do you think? Or I think Ms. Bachman did exactly which were two things and to Mrs. McCammon's question also. Um, we know that OT and PT do change as the year goes on. New children come in, new EPTs recommend different services. So there seems to be transfers that do occur throughout the year. So I think that was one piece of, of the request for the restoration. And the other piece is that we have planned and we recognize that there may be additional services um, because of recovery services, because of COVID and school closure that we're anticipating during um, both ESY and have already begun since the March to present date. Thank you, Mrs. Klein. Mrs. McCammon. So Shirley and Alan, I thank you kindly for pulling out the $216,000 number as what we sort of think the current estimate for, um, for uh, recovery services looks like. Um, was that already included in these OT and, and PT lines? How, how does it, um, or is, is that just based on what you know so far from PPTs plus what you can guesstimate from PPTs to come? Where, where is that number? Um, it's both. It's what we know from current PPTs and what we are guesstimating to come. And it's in the areas of contracted speech, contracted services, and occupational therapy. Mrs. McCammon. 
Um, so speaking also of what we can and can't plan for, one of the things that we often use budget control for is, historically is uh, special education Paris. So how are you thinking about variability in staffing in special education as we move into this next year? I think the same questions that come up. Um, may I answer that, by the way, Dr. Adley? Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Fine. Uh, so I think the same way we know an unanticipated um, students move in um, mid-year, which we've had already. Students um, have new recommendations throughout the year. So we know often that we can't plan for um, how many powers we might need for our students. So often we do go to budget control when that does happen. Um, there is no way to predict it because, again, of those two variables. And sometimes also, if you recall, um, the year before last, there were several students that moved in. We had, I think, at one point, an increase of 68 students, if I recall, um, with IEPs that moved in that year. So it's hard to really anticipate that. And we do rely on that. Thank you, Mrs. Klein. Any additional conversation on that? Mrs. McCammon. Uh Duke, have we ever gone to the Board of Finance to use the $100,000 special ed reserve that they have? Um, and is that something that we would be thinking about utilizing uh, in this coming year? I guess I, I say that to you, but I guess I address that to the board in general. My understanding, it has to be a very specific request associated with special education for that. I don't know if Mrs. Klein or Dr. Adley have additional comments or Mrs. Ackman, I know is part of it early on. Mrs. Ackman? Well, it predates me. However, I do think um, in terms of need and request that it needs to go through the full appropriation process. So while I think our, our Board of Finance um, ha would, would be willing to um, certainly meet our needs, we need to recognize that that process in and of its nature is somewhat bureaucratic. Um, so the flexibility would just need to be predictable, planned out, so we could go for all the necessary appropriations. Um, but, but my understanding, it it has sat there; it has been drawn down on before. Um, at this point, I believe it's about a hundred thousand dollars left in that reserve account. Mrs. Ritchie, thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Um, I would just suggest that we check with the Board of Finance because I know they did clean up a lot of those reserve accounts, and I'm. I can't remember if it was one of them, but I, I just feel like it was. So we should probably double check that that even exists anymore. Thank you, Mrs. Ritchie and Mrs. McCammon. We'll, I'll take that as a follow-up with the Board of Finance. Mr. Sini? Yeah, just as your follow-up, uh, Mr. Chairman, that, you know, how, how can we use it? Because it doesn't sound like we use it too frequently. Thank you. Mrs. Ackman? So the idea again goes back to budgeting and um, we, we need to budget for, for what we know for. So it couldn't be that, oh, we know we have a hundred thousand dollar need, but don't worry, it's over here. It would need to be a need that we could not have anticipated that we did not budget for. And that we all of a sudden said, there was no way for us to know for this, we have to go. And there are lots of situations in which that could happen. It does still exist. It has been talked about rolling it into the general fund that has not occurred yet. Um, but I do think that it does not allow us to make the decision. And while I, you know, I would hope that our board of finance too, it would be a board of finance decision of whether, how, when it is necessary to release those funds. So that there is a slightly different take on what this money is versus what budgeted appropriation dollars are. So thank you for that additional context. And I will take away as a follow-up to have a conversation with the Board of Finance and get some clarity around that. Thank you. All right, moving along. Um, RC25 fixed regular transportation to additional buses. Duke, can I go back to RC24? Mr. Maroney, you can go back to RC24. Thank you. So I know this is a little irregular, but I'm in listening to public comment and hearing the, the member, uh, spokesperson of Darian CPAC request to add, to cut $146,586 out of the budget has struck a chord with me. And I think we should have further discussion as a board on this. Um, you know, I know it's it's not traditional to to add more things at the public hearing, but 
to me, that's also what the public hearing is, to listen to what the public is saying. And I, I would like to propose a, a cut of 146586 for the for the SDS facilitators administrator position. Can I ask point of order? Um, the point of ad cut night historically has been to signal to the public what we're looking at cutting or adding and doing it post public hearing doesn't afford the public an opportunity to have their, their voice heard. So personally, I don't think we should be adding or cutting after we formulated the ad cut list. Mrs. Parrott. I, I will echo that. I am very uncomfortable adding something on at this point in the process. I think that was the purpose of last week. I think that you know doing this now does not afford the rest of the public to chime in on this, and I'm incredibly uncomfortable at doing anything more tonight. Mrs. McCabot. Um, I respect the points that, that Mrs. Perrin and, and Mrs. Stein are raising, but I, I do agree with Dennis that we do need time to reflect on what we hear when we see John pulling his his swim cut based on public comment and what he's heard and and some further reflection on on you know doing something from a policy perspective versus from a budgetary perspective so I, I will agree that I've also received some phone calls um, and I think there is public comment before the next uh, before we actually vote so I certainly think that it when at all possible, it's absolutely appropriate to get things done in a way that allows people time to respond. But I don't think we've cut the public out of the process if we have further discussion uh, tonight or in the future. Mr. Uh, Saini. Mr. Saini. Yeah, I'll just weigh in on the process and we do a public comment uh, next week. So the public will have the opportunity to comment. Um, I did, you know, uh, waive the, the cuts, uh, not on based on what I heard, but the focus on policy. Um, so we, you know, I just set precedent this evening. Um, and so I think it's, you know, we, it, oh, and by the we, I think we addressed these, this late, late into the meeting last week. So, uh, you know, there might've been some foggy minds that might've missed this. So I think we should give people the opportunity to make some, some revisions. Mrs. Ackman. Um, so I think there's a couple things going on here. One, I don't think that we, as a board, I think we take in public comment. I don't think we make our decisions based on public comment. So I guess my question would be for Mr. Maroney, what new information do we need to discuss about this? I think we've had um, whole parts of our meeting devoted to this. We've had presentations on it. It's been on the table since the very first presentation, including um, kind of a, a glimpse into what this might be in December. So while I reserve, I do think board members probably have the right to make ads or cuts um, and it's their duty. I guess my question would be, what else would you like us to discuss other than the comments from, um, I, I'm sorry, I, I, my, my dog ran off with my notes. I know that sounds crazy, so but my dog really did. He wants to go out and I'm ignoring him. So I don't know whether it was an individual or a group that made, I don't have my notes in front of me, but from one public comment um, on the issue. So I, I, I think we can have discussion on it. I think it's, it's unusual. I think that we try to do this so that we, the whole public plus and minus gets to weigh in, but what else are we looking for? And while it was late in the evening to Mr. Sini's points last night, this is not a new issue. So I would really need to hear something compelling to kind of break what is a long-standing precedent um, of adding at the last minute. I, I would just add, I heard probably more comments supporting it um, in those conversations this evening. I think um, if I go back to those long nights, but even subsequent information that's been sent out, I think we asked a lot of questions initially. I think presentations came back to the board, very detailed presentations about roles and responsibilities and pros and cons. So again, you know, look, happy to have the conversation, but what's the end game here? Um, I think that's what we have to ask ourselves. Mrs. Ritchie. So I just wanted to clarify and differentiate. Tonight was a public hearing. This is when we receive information from the public. 
and public comment is different than a public hearing. So I just wanna make sure people understand. And historically we have not changed. And so I know Mr. Cini is taking his, his item off, but we don't actually technically do that until next week. All these items stay on. We don't pull anything off this list. And it's very extraordinary to now have reopened a conversation about something that we have talked about. The opportunity was there to put this item on the list and I, I guess I, I've heard both sides of the argument for on this particular item. I have enough information and I'm comfortable with the cut ad list as it is. So I, I just wanted to make sure people understood tonight was a public hearing, public comment is different. And this is goes against what we typically do in this process because we want our public to come to the public hearing knowing our intent so we can have a good conversation. Thank you. Sorry, Mrs. McCammon. I will um, say that one of my primary concerns in this moment is that we are, yes, we do have our traditional ways, but we are in an extraordinary year. And I think one of the things that the facilitators represented was uh, strong uh, parent engagement um, and that that was a, a primary component of the role. And I am concerned about making, I think we need to discuss the implications of making a change to a role that has a, a, a engagement as a large piece in it at a period in time where our families and children of disabilities are probably more impacted uh, in some ways than some of our other families and may be struggling to engage and, and be interested in the budget process, not because they don't care, but because this is a really difficult time for children and families of children with disabilities. So I just want to offer, you know, kind of in the same spirit of not changing team teaching, um, that that my question is whether now is the right time to change the facilitators. I, I just, I have to say, we've had, Jill and Dennis, you've had opportunities. To, you could have added this last meeting and we had the presentation, we've had public comment by some of the speakers tonight on this very topic. So I'm a little confused as to why it is now being added when it could have been added during ad cut night and followed proper protocols. Nothing has changed. Mr. Sini. So I'm kind of still a newbie here, but if I heard something tonight that changed my mind, how do I make a revision to the proposed budget by the um, administration? Wouldn't I have to add this to the ad cut list? If you had something that changed your mind based on some change in facts or data, but I think we listened to someone's opinion on a specific program, I think we've had all the facts and the presentations and roles and responsibilities and pros and cons, and it didn't come up for any discussion or ads or cuts at the last meeting. So while we listened to public comment, we've listened to it all along. I think we wanna make sure the public understands, you know, the process that we've gone through. Mrs. But, I, I, I'm sorry, let me follow up to, as Deb said, this is a public, I'm sorry, this is a public hearing, not public comment. So we were right. sitting to hear the public's input and making revisions you know, based on what they're telling us. They don't want us to cut things, they want us to add things. They support things, they don't support things. So, you know, we heard tonight a couple differing views. So I guess if, you know, I heard something that I wanna, I changed my mind last minute, certainly I've heard a lot of things and I'm, I'm not even talking about this specifically. How do I then make a revision to the, the proposed budget at this point? Or is it too late? Is, is that what you're telling us? You can make a motion if it's like, we said there's no reason you can't make a motion and go through the process. It's just not not how we've normally done things. Mrs. Ackman. So picking off of what Mr. Steeney said, I, I think the onus is back on Mr. Maroney. What is it that you need to know? What is it? Are you suggesting this as a cut because you believe it's a cut? I think we need to be very careful as we've discussed in the past. You put something up because if you believe that it's a reasonable cut, at this point, it's not up for reasonable for more discussion. If it's more discussion, let's have the discussion now. What, what do you need to know? What can we do? We've got Mrs. Klein, we've got Dr. Adley, but this isn't, I mean, let's either do it or don't do it. Let's fish or cut bait. Do you need more information? 
let's have it out. Do you want it as a cut? And while I agree this is practice and I do think it's breaking precedent, board members have the right to put ads and cuts on the list. But I do think Mr. Maroney, you then owe it to your board members who, who did their homework and were ready to go last time to explain why now, what's different. And, and I think then this board has to have the discussion really tonight because you're asking us to consider something that we've been doing all of our work on the ad cut list. So let's have it tonight so we know how to make a decision next week. Oh, that's fair, Tara. And, and so, so my big concern and, and, the, and, and what I heard is about this inclusivity part and I'm really struggling with, are we, are we alienating um, members of our student body by creating this, this um, assistant principal position? And are we, are we dividing as opposed to bringing together and being inclusive of our, of our student body? And I'm struggling with that. And I realize that this is not what we normally do, but I, but I think it, I, I heard it, to me, it's a big ask when parents of special education are adding or asking to cut the special education budget. May I, is it appropriate, um, actually, may I just respond to, to the inclusive piece? Please. And thank you, Mrs. Klein. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. And, and I hope that our presentation was compelling or really addressed that because I know that was a question. And just like there are some parents I, I hear that are not in agreement, there are several parents that are in agreement and all members of the school community because we, we not only decide this on our own, but in concert with the principals, with the assistant principals, with the teachers, with the related service providers, with the general education staff and the entire faculty. And I hope what we said is not only do I don't see and I disagree, I see it as, and I hope I present it as inclusive. Um, the same way that our current assistant principals and principals are inclusive and they practice inclusivity. And to Mrs. McCammon's point, totally in understood. And I think the first points we made in our presentation were that we are not only going to maintain the, the position of the facilitators and one of the foremost things was about parent communication and reaching out and maintaining that, but that would not be compromised. Um, it would be maintained with the same integrity and fidelity. And if anything, there'd be opportunity for administrators to follow up on some of those um, recommendations and, and, and practices that happen at PPT meetings. This is to enhance the current role, not to compromise it. This is to maintain the fidelity and, and the transparency of the current role. And it changed because six years ago when that was developed, and as Mrs. McCammon actually pointed out at one of our prior meetings, it was really about decision-making um, and not prior determination of PPTs. We've achieved that and we've moved on. And what we're presenting now is really to go beyond what facilitators can do to embrace inclusion, to embrace fidelity, to be able to really build on instructional leadership in all of our classrooms, both in the general education classroom with children who are supported in those classrooms, as well as in the special education classroom. And I hope our presentation really presented um, the, the, the rigor of what we're asking for. So, so I'd to take the opportunity for me because I may not get another opportunity at it. Um, Did you raise your hand? Oh, I am. Actually. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Maroney, I, I respect uh, your concerns and your opinions. I will say this. Um, uh, for anybody who knows me and know, knows my history, um, I've always, always been an advocate of, of inclusion model of special education, always. And I thought for a second that this was a creating a silo in any of the schools. They're, they're, they wouldn't be on the table to start with. Uh, this, is, this is the absolute opposite. Um, this is a wonderful, this is one of the biggest things in this budget. Um, when, you, when, you, when, you, when it's assigned to sort of like assistant principals and administrators, I understand that, that uh, it, 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 it causes that, you know, uh, concern and possibly further further elaboration and explanation uh, but this is one of the biggest things for changing the experience for kids for changing the, the experience of special education in the classrooms these spike these uh, assistant principals will be, they're specialized in uh, uh, special education law and expertise and instructional practices uh, this also is going to expand the practices for all kids this is not a, this is not a, a uh, an isolation thing. Uh, it's actually an inclusive uh, uh, practice. Again, as I shared my own experience over the years, there's no great. Your principals, by the way, are not going to give up 
other principals coming in <coughs> special education and so on. It's not just completely isolated to this one particular person. Yes, this one person has the uh, oversight, but they also have the responsibility for for implementation and accountability and so on and so forth. Uh, I, all, I can, all I can try to share is, is the process for uh, inclusiveness and um, Again, as an assistant principal myself, as a principal myself, the one of the greatest privileges I ever have is, is sitting at uh, PPTs and, and from an inclusive point of view. But this is one of the biggest things in the budget, there's no doubt about it. Um, and uh, I, I strongly, strongly advocate for this as a, as a very positive move. You may not get a better choice. You may, not, you may say this is not the year. Well, I don't think you'll get it again. I don't think there will be an opportunity. And I think it's a perfect opportunity uh, to, make, to make the change. Mrs. Ritchie. Um, since we've opened the discussion, I'll just say that when this was first proposed to us, I was apprehensive because of the inclusion aspect and also um, always going to scrutinize additional administration because of the budgetary implications. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you, thank you, Shirley, for your presentation because you sold me. I see the benefit, I see the need, and I fully support this change, so thank you. Mrs. Parent. Thank you. I was just going to say that we've had this discussion already. Like Mrs. Stein, or Mrs. Klein's answer was the same that she gave a few weeks ago. So I just want to say thank you. We've had the information. And I, you know, what else do you, what to Dennis and to Joe, what else do you need to know? What other data do you have? Because we've had all the information put forth. And um, I personally would just like to move on. I'm in full support of this. I think people have been pretty clear in public comment in the previous meetings. I'm counting in my head four times that this conversation has come up in public comment where people have presented it to us for further conversation and dialogue. I think it really drove the additional presentation that Mrs. Klein made to the board. So, um, you know, happy to keep the dialogue open, happy to take a motion as is as should be done and as is respectful to all the board members, but. I, I look to uh, those folks raising the, the question as to what additional conversation or, or information you're looking for at this point, or if you want to move forward with the motion. Yes, Dr. You can't make a motion. It's a special meeting and there's no action, so we cannot make a motion, sorry. And but, I'll, just, but, I'll just share for a quick perspective of, of four of the schools that have done at the elementary level. Um, and I think some board members actually attended some of them, so. I'm certainly not speaking out of turn. Uh, I think that uh, for those of you who are there, we'd agree that there's uh, a high level of support for this among the, the parent community, at least from those four schools. So Deb, the, the expert or whoever, can we, can the board member well, it, it's add, a, it, add or it, delete? It's a special meeting, so we can't put on an action item, but I, I guess they could um, I, I don't know. I guess we could try to. We just add it to the. You, 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 I don't. You don't need a motion. No one moved the other week to put things on. Every board member had the right to put things on. Mr. Maroney or any other board member, while unusual and I'm sorry, highly unusual, could could do it and 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 could do it without a motion. You don't. You don't need action by the board. None of us took action the other night. Thank um, you. Thank you for what, the clarity. Well, so Duke, what my, my or Mr. Deneen, what my, my hand was raised for originally to say, as context, I think part of the most powerful part of Mrs. Klein's presentation, and she addressed this question several times, this is not the first time, was that um, the inclusion issue, and while it's not always what other districts did, we have the Westport model. There have not been claims as far as we know. In fact, the district has reported that it has helped the program. I, I feel like if parents really felt that this was exclusionary, we would be hearing that and, and kind of professionals talking to each other wouldn't bring it. Now, now, we don't make decisions of what people do in New Canaan or Westport or anywhere else. So we have to do it ourselves. But again, I'd go back to Mr. Maroney and Mrs. McCann, I saw your hand, so I'm not leaving you, you out on this, but what is it that's so compelling that you've heard tonight? And then I think you have to decide, are you putting this on as an add or a cut or, or making an adjustment? But, but part of that, I think at this point, the board needs to know what new question or information um, you need or have or have felt in order to do so. Mr. Saini. 
I, I, again, I, I'm going back. The, the process was somebody made a suggestion or question whether or not this item could be added to the ad cut list. And we're debating the item now, and it's not even on the ad cut list. So let's let's make a decision and then move forward. Yes, unusual, but we did hear from CPAC, and, and you know there was some compelling uh, argument. Now I'm not weighing in on either side, but from a proper process standpoint, a board member should have the opportunity to put it in. And the public can make comment next meeting, and we'll vote on it at that point. Thank you, Mr. Cini. I have no issue with um, adding it as a cut or however it wants to be presented, but I also need to understand from a timeline perspective and from a work perspective, what additional information may be required or is it that you need over and above what we've had out there? Um, it's a tight timeline. Uh, these things require a lot of work over and above the day job of the administration. So what other information do you need uh, to help with your kind of thought process through this? This is I, I don't need any information. I just think it's something that we should discuss. I mean, there's 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 items on here that we all don't agree on. It doesn't have to be a, a nine to zero vote to put this on as, a, as an ad or a cut. So Dennis, we're discussing it and I'll sit here all night because I'm not kicking the can down the road again. All right, let's discuss it. If you have nothing further to discuss, then add it or let's move on. I would like to add it as a, as a cut. Is there any additional information you're requiring from the administration to help you make this decision? I am not. Thank you. Mrs. McCannon. I would just um, like the separate but equal question um, answered um, and maybe for next week, it doesn't have to be tonight, but I, I think that's, um, I think that deserves some consideration, please. Could you just, Jill, Jill, just kind of clarify that again? I'm not sure I fully understand. Sure, there was a there was a statement uh, in during public comment that there were concerns that this was um, separate but equal, um, and and that's just something I think that we should uh, pay proper attention to. Um, so, so Mrs. Mrs. Klein or Dr. Adley, can we have further discussion on that this evening? I, I'd be glad to respond to that, uh, Mrs. McCammon. I'm not quite sure what the intention was of separate but equal. Um, I only see it as equal. So I don't know the best way to address the separate piece. Um, and again, I hope that in our presentation, um, the equal is that administrator has the same responsibility as the other administrators, but has different expertise to add and to help improve instruction and support learners. So I don't even, I can't really attend to the notion of separate because that's not my lens. And that's not the lens of anyone who uh, contributed to the idea of this would improve teaching and learning for all students, and especially in terms of SDI. So I don't see a separate piece. So I don't know how I can answer the question of separate because I only see it as equal. And I hope you know that that's my, my belief, um, you know, in, in terms of all of our practices. Shirley, I'm, I, I'm not asking necessarily for your personal belief. I'm thinking more that I, from, a, from an institutional perspective, whether or not we have to ask ourselves the question of separate but equal. I know that it exists in other districts. Um, I just, I think that when someone says separate but equal, uh, you just have to pay attention. So I, I'm just asking that. And res I, I hear that. And respectfully, I see it as equal. I don't see it as separate. Thank you. Anything to add, Dr. Adley? No, I think it's a... Uh, um, I've asked Ms. McKevin respectfully what she thinks that question, the intent of that question is because if I have a clear intent of the question, I can certainly answer. Sure. I, I think that, um, you know, the traditional example would be one water fountain for one group of people and another water fountain for a different group of people. And that was, that was the, that was sort of some of the separate but equal. So I think when someone throws that language out, we just need to attend to it. And I don't mean throws it out. I mean, when we're asked the question, we need to, to answer, we need to. Uh, uh, that, that, that's pretty easy for me to answer too. So that, that's fine. I, uh, I mean, our, our system principles are, are, are for all children. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ritchie. So I, I just wanted um, Dennis to clarify the dollar amount because I only heard that he was putting something on the table, but I need, I would like to know the specific dollar amount that he would then be cutting from the budget. Thank you. 
$1,586. Okay, Mr. Rudel, I lost you visually. <laughs> but do you have that and that aligns with the dollar amount associated with the change in that role? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mrs. Ackman. So again, I, I caution this board. We have had a lot of terms thrown out at us in public comment. Fantasyland was one of them. And I don't think this board ever felt like they were in fantasy land. Separate but equal is a complex legal um, argument that had to do with civil rights. I understand that there are parents who are concerned that they feel that this might um, create inequities. I think Mrs. Klein has explained that, but the idea that we would say that this board is considering something akin to separate water fountains is outrageous to me. There may be concerns about this, but we are not, and if this board wants to say that it is entering into a separate but equal argument, then, then this conversation never should have gotten this far. I, I'm sorry, I find we, we do not control the public's words, but we do control as sitting elected officials, the terms we choose to pick up. And that's incredibly upsetting to me that we, it, it's not upsetting to me, Mrs. McCammon's question. It's upsetting to me that we're saying that this is akin to something like that. I think it's a very powerful term. It's a very emotional term and it's a complex legal understanding. Mrs. Parent. No. All right, thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. McCammon, any further information that you require from an administration standpoint in terms of the, um, this topic? No, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. McCammon. All right. So, Dennis, just to confirm, we've added that to the cut list and there's no additional information you're looking for from the administration right now. Correct, and thank you. Thank you, Dennis. All right. Um, RC 25, uh, regular transportation, uh, two additional buses. Um, just to recap at the last meeting, um, there was a motion to not change the policy um which was voted on and accepted and there was also a motion not to change the walk radius um so while this is in here and we'll vote on it next week just to recap what happened at last meeting any further conversation or discussion around this mr Sini? sorry I, just repeat that dude because i think uh, it, we voted not to increase the walk radius and not to increase the number of buses on a test basis, right? Correct. Not to okay. change the policy and not to add the buses on a for a test policy. Yeah. So I guess whoever put this in, I just want to understand if we're, we were to approve it, where would these dollars go? Because the board has already said no to changing the policy and no to two additional test buses. Uh, right. And I think, I think these John, were, I added it and it was prior to our policy conversation. So, as I've stated before, I'm not removing, I don't have the power to remove or add things right now. It stays on. Got it. Thank and you. We it's vote just... on it. We vote on it on Tuesday. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. The process got it on there before we went to the policy discussion. Thank you, Mrs. Stein. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Mrs. Ogman. So I, I think to be clear, and, and I left the meeting, so I'm re-watching it. Um, so I just add in a few things. One, um, what Mrs. Stein has done has added $176,000 to fixed um, expenses. She, she still can do that, that that can pass and that can pass for buses. This board can vote differently one week to the next, although that would be very confusing for the public, I would note. Um, but I do think that um, what I would add is I heard a lot of concerns about data for buses um, what I didn't, and I would disagree that we need more data, or again, I would ask the board what, more, what data they need. I think the question really is, do we need to ex, ex, have experience? Because rider experience is very different. We can have all the data in the world. We have yet to put in buses and have the experience of it. So 
I think I would agree with Mrs. Stein that this still stands as an add or a cut, just like we were saying all the others. Mr. Sini has indicated that he will not support, um, you know, one of the things that he threw in there. That's fine. Mrs. Stein may choose not to, but um, not being there, I wanted to put in that I think what we're missing is ridership experience, and we're only going to have that if we have buses. And two, that this this remains as an active vote until next week. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Okay. All right, moving on to COVID to RC 28, the COVID RC. So just to give a little more context here, um, Dr. Adley and myself and Rich, and I invited Tara as head of the finance committee. We had a conference call with um, Tom Mooney with respect to COVID RCs and COVID budgeting. His guidance was, as we build a budget, we cannot build a budget um, anticipating a deficit or trying to anticipate an appropriation. So that if we feel in opening the schools next September and in building this budget right now, that we anticipate COVID expenses and we can determine what timeline that may be, the first half of the year, the first six months, that we should build those expenses into the current budget that we're building. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Dr. Adley, in terms of the guidance. No, uh, you've, you've reflected its, its guidance accurately. Um, okay. That's All, right. All right, good. So uh, with that, I don't know, do you wanna touch base on this or? Uh, no, no, all I would say is, I mean, the, the decision, I guess the first decision is actually is the board going to go ahead with yeah. the, this particular RC? Should it go ahead with the RC? Uh, had the opportunity just to reflect on some of the numbers that are in here and perhaps some adjustments to it. If if the board is is going to yeah. commit to, we would like to either uh, plan for COVID or COVID for for six months. I mean, at this particular point, I've actually been saying that some some of the PTO meetings that are going that I probably anticipate that we're going to be in some sort of uh, social distancing or COVID related sort of experience. I'm not a, I'm not an epidemiologist or a doctor or I can't speculate either, but, but it seems reasonable that we might be in that particular situation. Uh, there seems to be some consensus that it, we probably will be to some degree or another. So that's the case. Uh, I've tried to review some of these that, that were put forward by the, uh, the board the last time and adjust where I think we might adjust if we were planning for a six month period per se, so to speak. So I'm happy to share some of the things that that would look like if that was the case, but perhaps there needs to be more board discussion about this matter. So I'll add to that also, just from a clarity standpoint, because I think there was some discussion around this too, but Mr. Mooney's guidance was that we continue to track and keep things in a separate COVID RC. He said, that's the best way to do it um, in terms of how we've been tracking it especially if we do go over and above what the budget was and we do have to go for an appropriation. It's easier also for tracking it that way. If additional federal or state grants come into play in the fall, there's always that option uh, depending on how that plays out with the government. So keeping a specific uh, COVID RC and then also looking at what we feel are reasonable expenses, at least in the first half of the year, uh, around COVID, around social distancing, PP&E equipment, custodial supplies, nursing, um, cleaning, um, and overall staffing. So I'll pause there and, and open it up for further uh, board conversation. And uh, we can also discuss what Dr. Adley and, and Rich have looked at in terms of uh, potential uh, line items and dollars. Uh, Mrs. Ritchie. Um, thank you. I'm glad to hear Tom's uh, perspective on all of that. And from my perspective, I would love to hear from the administration in terms of what they would change to what I put on the table in terms of COVID expenses. It does look like some of the stuff Tara put a different dollar amount. So there's some things that, that are duplicate in there between what I proposed and what Tara proposed. So I think it would be good to have a sense before next Tuesday, which of the items administration 
would like to adjust? Are there items that they would like to add? So I'm, I'm really at this point interested in hearing administration's perspective. Thank you. So I think we'll get to that in just a moment. I think that's, thank you, Mrs. Ritchie. Let's just continue with some questions so we can capture them. If it's all directed toward hearing what the administration has to say, we can do that also. Mr. Sini. I'm sorry, so the administration has a proposal that it wants to bring forth to us. Is that what you're saying, Duke? They want to have a conversation about some work that they've done as to what they see or potential line item expenses. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear a proposal that comes from the administration because this is a 180 from their original stance, whether or not this was suitable. I'm glad uh, it was raised. I'm glad there was due diligence done behind it. And uh, I guess the, I would just also want to ensure that we're not tripping into any minimum budget um, issues uh, as well. OK, but uh, yeah, I, I would love to hear a proposal from the administration around this now that we're hearing that it's a, a best practice, if you will. Thank you, Mr. Senior. Mrs. Ackman. So I would agree that we need to hear a proposal from the administration. I mean, I did it. My my proposed were based on you know what I thought, but that, that doesn't mean that I had an exhaustive list or I even had the right list. So um, mine was more putting things that I thought we could reasonably anticipate. And it, it wasn't to be clear, it wasn't, okay, give us six months of expenses. My thought was it is reasonable to presume social distancing for a minimum of six uh, months. If the administration thinks that's four months or six months or eight months and talking with its advisors, I'm willing to entertain that. So I would look at my list as kind of, I was trying to start um, the conversation because um, I, I, I think I would just stress it's more than a best practice, it's a statutory requirement. And Mr. Mooney, um, Mr. Mooney confirmed that and I'm not, I'm not picking on John's words by any means. I just think we all need to understand that he was very clear that we, if we knew there were expenses, we had to put them in the budget in the best interest of the town. It, it wasn't even the best interest of the board. It was, we, we needed to let the town know what we were going to expend. That's our duty. So I, I would say as the administration looks at mine, I don't feel tied to anything. I really wanna hear what you think you need um, but I do think we we need that sooner than later because I, I can't make a decision next week, receiving it next week. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Yeah, I think we should move just to the conversation with the work that's been done by the administration. I think uh, Mrs. Ritchie and Mrs. Ackman's information here kind of started the conversation, but I think the uh, administration has done a preliminary review and um, we can discuss it this evening and then fine tune it and get information out for people to review and uh, go through some questions this week so we have the information we need prior to the next meeting. So I'll turn it over to you to Dr. Adley and Mr. Rudel. Okay, uh, well, just contextually also while uh, Attorney Mooney has said that, I will say that the, the, the surrounding towns are, are dealing with it in different ways. Uh, some of them are bringing a uh, significant amount forward, some of them are bringing a smaller amount forward, and some of them aren't doing, aren't quite doing it at all. So, um, that just, just again, just, just, yep. uh, just context. Uh, if I may, um, Richard, do you have the opportunity? Do you have the ability just to pull up some stuff? Sure. Um, just because what I probably end up doing is, we did do this for six months because I don't know that I have any information. Um, uh, we're hopeful, and I don't think it's going to be for a year, but I'm not completely sure about that. And to, to do it for any less than the six months might be. Um, just, uh, I don't know the, um, how to get my head around like a one month, two month, three month type thing. So it just seemed reasonable if we were doing it for, if we were doing it for this uh, a period of time, it just a period of time that six months seemed at least reasonable. Um, and we, we could go from there. So my, my proposal would be here just to cross reference what was put on the table uh, at our last budget meeting, uh, which is on this list actually. So. Essentially, I would cross-reference this with this okay. um, and do some modifications where we thought uh, the modifications uh, would be useful here. You'll see that the, right away that we have some dis we have some sections here for uh, social distancing. And once we do once we do the sections, we can't you can't do the sections for half a year type thing. Once you split them, you split the classes. 
I uh, don't think we're going to be bringing them back in again, even if it's uh, even if it is a half a year. You'll notice there that uh, token eight, um, it's in RC eighteen already on um, the budget control. So that's that, that's one already spoken for. Uh, LPN. So some of them, some of these, uh, uh, it was Deb, Terra, yeah, Deb and Terra primarily um, put these on the table the last time. So uh, I'll just mention them. It may just be some different dollars just for for the half year, mm -hmm. but. Uh, Part-time custodians that we've discussed before, custodial overtime, uh, the PPEs, if these again for all for a half year, custodial supplies that we need, the director of nursing staff, some of these again are being are, are in the original proposal. Materials, the materials are essentially if we have different uh, sections, the way we did this year, we had different educational materials, we need additional uh, sections of educational materials. Uh, bus cleaning, storage boxes, YMCA, girls women again, the same that we had this year and the contractual cleaning at the weekends and there's a little bit of an offset there and you'll see two asterisks at the bottom uh, if launch monitors are approved then we're going to probably need uh, more supervision in there at, at the cost that we've priced out and the cafeteria account depends on what we're in hybrid days or otherwise as to whether we're going to experience a loss and that uh, continued loss in that, that account so really it's just a calibration the, the concept's the same are you planning are you planning for something in this case for six months if that's the case? And um, if that's the case, then this is our best thinking at this particular point. I would say that, um, Mr. Shaney, uh, in terms of 180 for me, uh, I didn't bring forward a COVID budget. I wasn't planning necessarily on the COVID budget. Uh, the budget discussion came up uh, in terms of should we do that? And uh, so I, it's my responsibility to work with the board in terms of engaging in that discussion, whether that is. Uh, makes sense to do, um, whether we're advised to do that with our council or otherwise. Uh, so that's a that's a process that came uh, after actually presented the superintendent's budget, uh, but I respect that and given the direction we're going and the, the discussion whether we actually do this as a board or not. But if we are going to do it, these are numbers that uh, we would we would sort of uh, with with your understanding and permission or otherwise uh, mm -hmm. we would we would adjust these accordingly unless there was discussion about what, why they're so significantly different or otherwise. So just just to continue understanding this, so just some storage boxes are the connex boxes yes. that are used for furniture and equipment. Mm -hmm. The girls swimming would stay and play just because that's how that played out this yep. year and they've established that fact and that's a separate um, after the budget season accounting discussion. Um, contracted cleaning over the weekends, custodial supplies. Is any of this based on in-person, remote, or hybrid learning, or is it just a best guesstimate as to we may be back full time, we may move into hybrid? You know, a lot. Well, if you, it's, just, well, it's all a it's all a crystal ball for. Well, there is a week. I mean, there's a week better of that, but assuming that we're in person, right? Um, to some degree here, or, or hybrid. Okay. Um, if, we're, if we're remote completely, then mm -hmm. you know, some of the custodial stuff we won't be doing as much of. Right. But that, that's, a, that's, a big, that's a good faith estimate if we were planning to do uh, for six months. Okay. And it's Can you for, see six us for, months, question for, six, for six months, um, you looked at this uh, in terms of being back to kind of in-person learning in September? In-person hybrid, yeah. Okay. I'm not seeing everyone on the screen, so um, I'll, the first person I see is uh, Mrs. Stein. Um, Alan, one question, or Rich, if we keep the paras and don't have lunch monitors, will we see an addition of lunch monitors here? I see middle school, but not elementary. Yeah, so if the lunch monitors are not kept in the budget, uh, we would have to add, we would, uh, there would be 10, which is what you have now, which would be about eighty $81,000 for 90 days. Thank you. Do a quick question. Two yes, questions. Mr. Question. Brown. Sorry. Um, I know we've mentioned, I've heard of six months, and I, but I see 90 school days, which to me is three months. I'm just not sure how long this period is. If I could just clarity on that. Please. I should say half a school year, to, be, to, to clarify. I should say half a school year. 
Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. And then just the other question, uh, point of information probably, just serving as a board member. I'm trying to understand why is it not an issue to propose changes to ad cut numbers now? But when another member mentioned ad cut numbers earlier, that was the end of board practice as we know it. Could someone explain the distinction between those requests, please? Well, I would say that these were already put on the table by board members on ad cut night. The administration is clarifying because when they were put on, those two board members asked for the administration to sort of look at their numbers. And in the meantime, there's been conversation with board council. So these were already on the table on ad cut night. They aren't new additions. Does that answer your question, Mr. Brown? Uh, sort of. Maybe this will be an ongoing question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mrs. Stein. Uh, looking for other hands. I only, I only see three people. Can you take down the uh, shared screen and maybe you can see us all? Yeah, or just, just speak up. Mr. Cini, do you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, you know, from a proper process, we're, this is a big number, um, you know, thrown late in the process. And I understand why I'm, I'm sympathetic, definitely. Um, but, you know, definitely hasn't been properly vetted, even from what was proposed last week, right? I, I, don't, I can't add the numbers quick enough, but it, it, it's a big number. And we haven't also had to have a town-wide discussion on this and, and how to account for it and how the rest of the town is accounting for these uncertainties. So I guess that would be my request over the next week. We, you know, from a town practice, how's the town budgeting, um, you know, for, for COVID going forward? Um, because these, this, these dollars will go into the tax base or, or I should say go into the uh, mill rate and will be, you know, taxed accordingly for the next year. So I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page and how we're accounting for this, um, given the uncertainty of the numbers too. Um, and so just, and also Dr. Adley to be clear. So you're assuming full time, five days a week uh in person all sports regular um in these numbers um just so we know the basis for for the underlying assumptions well it'd be, it, it, it would be it would be hybrid um or in person at this particular point uh the sports rich did you did you include the sports or i just want to make sure did you include all sports so we didn't assume any savings from sports so it's assumed that sports would happen as is uh, the only issue would be we wouldn't rent out our buildings to what we're doing now. So you would have a cost to rent out the YMCA for girls' school. Thank you. Mrs. Ackman. So I, I would agree this is a big number. Might I suggest that if we go down this route, given that it's part of a COVID RC, we um, we make a commitment to anyone reviewing this budget, both the Board of Finance and the RTM, that we would track as diligently we did this year and any monies in this fund, if they weren't going to COVID, like if COVID ends after 60 days, we won't just say, oh, it's our appropriation, we can move it. We make a promise and a commitment that these, this RC, this particular RC, almost like budget control will only be used for specific purpose of COVID. And so if for some reason something happens and we only need 60 days of costs or 45 days of costs or 82 days of costs, um, we make a commitment to the other town boards that we would freeze these accounts and return them um, as needed. Or if there needs to be any change, we enter into that conversation with them. Because I, I do think this is unique. I do think this is a much larger number than even um, I anticipated. I do think it's required, but I think that this is really a matter of trust. Like, do you trust that we want to get our kids back in school and this is what we need to do for them and we're asking for this money because of COVID and, and we won't use it for anything other than that. So I, I think maybe if we could put our stamp and seal of approval on that, that might be a little more palatable as some high numbers now get bantered about. So uh, I would, uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I would also just, uh, you forgive me for, for uh, having this fleeting thought, um, but but the conundrum a wee bit, um, it shouldn't be, but but I mention it that, uh, and, and well, just, just full transparency type thing, if we put this forward like this, 
my, my, one of my concerns might be if, if we have to experience a reduction for some reason or some way, that all the things that are going to go are going to be all the other things in this budget because these are these these COVID things are are if these are critical to us, um, then it's unlikely I'm thinking that we'll be reducing that. So it, it, I'm hoping that's not the case. But yeah, but I think I, it, look, it's a good point to bring up. But unfortunately, I would think and we'll have ongoing conversations with our friends at the Board of Finance and the RTM committees that they need to look at them separately. And just because we put a million dollars on the table for what we see as COVID expenses, that we've done a good job of tracking. Rich and his team have done a phenomenal job. We're going through the appropriation process. I think we've proved ourselves this year to the point of some of Tara's comments, but I think we would have to make it perfectly clear that that is, you know, there are two separate distinct things they have to look at. They cannot look at our regular education, special education budget that we've proposed and think just because we're proposing a million dollars here, they've got to figure out some stuff on the other side there. That just would not be a fair, appropriate approach to the budget process. Uh, Mr. Sini. So, yeah, I mean, it, you guys are raising some really good points. And again, for a proper process in this, we just uh, added a million dollars to our forecast with zero public input on this. Uh, I mean, we had that you did have pu uh, public uh, input on the numbers that Tara and Deb put forward. But, um, you know, these other boards, the RTM, Board of Finance, and the general public haven't had a chance to weigh in. So I'm just concerned, you know, the dollar amount without us kind of vetting the all the questions that might come our way. And I, I get the narrative that we will return it all, but we can't commit to that as a board in the future, right? So you're right, there, there will be an element of trust, but I think part of that element of trust is giving the opportunity for everybody to really weigh in on this and, and think, uh, you know, collaboratively on it. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Mrs. Perrin. Um, F and B had their meeting the other night, and they they opined on this idea, and they were in full support of us budgeting for COVID. I, I, there was no actual number that they were bantering about, but they were in full support minus one abstention of of us doing this, with the understanding that we clearly track it as COVID expenses, and if it is not spent um, as a COVID expense, that it goes back. So they just reporting that. Out. Thank you, Mrs. Parent. This is McCammon. Um, Duke, I'm, I'm curious specifically for, for um, the purposes of thinking about MBR, I'd like to be reassured that we would be okay on MBR. Um, I'm also just thinking about it from the perspective of taxation. We're adding tax dollars that we may or may not spend. Would it make more sense to dip into the reserves that we, we do have healthy reserves that that conversation has been had? Um, is that an area where we should dip in? And so related to that question is I, I appreciate to, uh, Mr. Mooney's point about making sure that you plan for expenses that you can anticipate. And certainly I'm, I'm grateful that board members raised this. I am curious to know if a parallel appropriation process would meet uh, what Mr. Mooney's request was, again, with the concern that that a, a, a year over year operating budget's a bit different from this type of spend. I think in the conversation with, with Mr. Mooney, we cannot just build a budget thinking we're gonna go for an appropriation. That if we can estimate expenses tied specifically to COVID in the interest of the town and from a planning perspective, we should do that. If we need an appropriation over and above that, that's kind of the normal process to go through. Um, Mr. Rudel, um, can you, I think Jill brings up a good question on the MBR and we put a million dollars onto this budget. What are your thoughts around that? So if you add a million dollars to the budget, it becomes part of your base budget when you're doing your fiscal 23 budget. Right, but how do you think we counter that? This conversation happened the other day at RTM F and B too. I mean, you've got general wage increases out the next couple of years also. Correct. So when you when you add a million dollars or any dollar amount, that's kind of your new threshold for the year. Um, so the budget for the following year could not be reduced by that dollar amount. 
um, while supplemental appropriations do factor into MBRs, uh, you would, would be building in essentially a million dollar credit when you do the fiscal 23 budget. And to that point, Rich, if we built in the million and we returned 500,000, that really doesn't affect that threshold that we've established. Correct. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Ackman. I'm sorry, but M MBR is never how we have budgeted before. We have put in a million dollars to a budget. We've taken million dollar cuts. And, and I, I understand the concept, but we can't start making educational decisions based on MBR. We, we can say, what is the district, district need over an appropriation for a year? We need COVID expenses. We can debate the COVID dispense expenses that Dr. Adley has put forward, just like we've debated everything else Dr. Adley has put forward. We may agree, we may not agree. We may think the length of time is reasonable or not, but we have not made any other budgetary decision based on MBR. I really think that while, yes, it is, it is a financial reality and, and there are things you can do with MBR, we have to follow our statutory mandate. And, and, and maybe what we need to say is there needs to be relief for MBR for COVID expenses, or maybe we need to go to our legislators and we need to talk about MBR being very different this year. But I, I, I worry that we start making decisions based on MBR. That is not our mandate. And it has never been our mandate. It wasn't our mandate after special education, our special education crisis, and it's not our mandate after um, after after COVID. So sorry, I think my my battery is getting low. I, I just don't know that that is how board should be considering the educational needs of the district, which this year include COVID. We can get into what do you need? Do you really need a million dollars? That's a good discussion and it is coming late in the game, but that's because people needed to realize the statutory obligation to, that, we, that we face on this. So I would hate the idea that all of a sudden, because we need to pay for PPE, we're cutting off learning opportunities for kids. I think Duke and Dr. Adley make a really good um, point. We would need to really go forward and say, this is what we need educationally to move the district forward. And this is from a health and safety standpoint, what we need to move the education forward. And that's where good relationships and trust with boards come. This year, we trusted the board of finance that they would be there for our appropriation. We meet with them at a special meeting on Thursday. And, and, and we have trusted them in that. We might need to say, now you need to trust us on this. We, we can't not fulfill our mandate. And, and we can kind of debate whether what Dr. Adley has put forward is what we really need. Like that's also our job. So that's my take. I, I, MBR is, MBR, it would be a mistake to make decisions based on MBR. Thank you, Mrs. Ackman. Mrs. Ritchie. So just to Rich, um, on MBR, we can next year, have a flat budget and then of course we have our contractual obligations would you i know this is, might be hard off the top of your head know what next year's increase to our contractual obligations i'm going to guess it's like over two million dollars so no matter what we're going to have two million dollars in there for contractual obligations so i'm i'm kind of i'm not really concerned about mbr because i think even if we went forth with a, a flat budget when we factor in our contractual obligations, I don't think we're going to be looking at um, a, a reduced appropriation. But maybe you can touch on that some more for us. Thanks. So your 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 collective bargaining agreements and your wages would exceed uh, two million dollars based on what's in place. And depending on what happens <clears throat> with health insurance, you're probably looking at another quarter of a million to seven hundred fifty thousand dollars there as well. That was actually the conversation I believe that Mr. Davis had at RTM budget also. He, I think, referenced that specifically in terms of contractual obligations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adley. Yeah, I, uh, I again, a speculation, but um, I would firmly uh, speculate and believe that you probably get uh, legislative relief from this. I do, I do honestly, I do, I do think it. But no guarantees in the legislature, but as you know, but... but uh, I, I would be pretty confident you would. I think it's something to, I think it was Mrs. Ackman's point, we'd have to continue to track and be very closely aligned with 
any of these topics that come up legislatively, you know, with our leaders up in Hartford, that well, would make sense. We can bring them up too. Yeah, so. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Brown. Hi, just really quickly. Um, I know that's a six month number. Are we required to do six months or could we do three months or month by month? I'm just trying to understand if there's a requirement. No, no Mr. Brown, I, I'm not under any requirement. Um, uh, I thought what would be reasonable is to, is to plan out for the half a year, but uh, certainly the board, uh, the collective decision as to what, what, what way we should do this, if we're going to do it. So uh, that, that's an open discussion, Mr. Brown. I think it's a good question. It's a good question, Mr. Brown. And I think, you know, we probably look at things in the first half of the year and the second half of the year. And I think in part of the conversations we've had, you've got back to school. So you've got everyone coming off summer vacation. Does that start in person? Does that start hybrid? You go right into the holidays. So I think part of it was planning around that. Um, but and we can also kind of slice the numbers for three months, six months, and out a year, just so everyone has the full picture. And I just had two follow-up really quick. One's technical for Rich, one's just a history if anyone wants to chime in. For Rich, the question is, you mentioned, if we set our baseline here uh, by adding this million dollars next year, and then we get to the year after that, it remains as a baseline. Are we required to spend that much again, or is that just an accounting and we just take it down and it makes comps a little weird year over year, or is there a requirement? Because I thought we we're on zero-based budgeting. At least. You're, not, you're not required to spend it. Uh, so if you were to add this uh, amount, you'd have that million dollars in the budget. Let's say you don't spend any of it. Right. The following year, theoretically, if COVID's over, you would reduce that money from your budget of a million dollars. So you'd have a million dollar reduction going against whatever your contractual obligations are, um, any new investments or whatever other changes you had in the budget. Okay, so it would just charge, it would just change the comparability year in, year out, but we're not required. That's not our fix. We must okay. spend that much every year going forward. You don't have to spend that million dollars, but your total base is that. Uh, it did, yeah, it didn't make sense intuitively. I just want to make sure I heard it right. And then the only other question I would have is, have we ever been in a situation where the board ran deficits for a period? And, and how did the board manage that? If anyone here can offer just, I'm trying to get a little perspective. I don't recall, Dave, in my time on the board, other than what we've done over the last year. And um, I think we've done that well. Um, in terms of the tracking and working with the Board of Finance. Um, people keep moving around. Sorry, Mrs. Ackman. So I, I think we have to be careful. We're using a lot of terms. This year, and, and there was some talk of it last meeting, we are not running a deficit at the moment, or so we've been told. We are running a projected deficit. That is very different. What Mr. Mooney was saying, and this goes to Dave's question to put a fine point on it, we have to budget for what we think is reasonable. We can't just say, oh, I want to do three months. I want to do two months. We can say we think three months is reasonable. We can say we think one month is reasonable, but we have to have reason behind it. It's not just pick a number or what would be good for the budget to pick a number. It's what do we think that we will anticipate? And part of that is so that the town can knowingly understand when it's approving our budget, what we're going to spend so it can ask taxpayers as it goes out with its taxes. They can choose to fund our appropriation a bunch of different ways, but it, it's not like pick a number and pick a number that works well. It's not, we cannot knowingly ask for an appropriation knowing that we will run deficit. So, the projected deficit is because we didn't understand, and this is the point Mrs. Ritchie and I were making, is we didn't know what COVID was going to be. When our budget was approved, masks were still being debated. Whether schools would open would still be debated. This year, we know schools can open. This year, we know certain PPE will need to be in place. Therefore, we need to plan for them. We as a board need to decide, based on the administration's recommendation, what is reasonable and what is not. But it's not just a matter of choice, right? Because Dave, I think you ask a really good question. It's not just, well, do we do six? Do we do three? It's what do we as a board think is reasonable to expect that the school system will need to pay for in the coming year for COVID? I uh, thought months sorry. was reasonable. I, I would just respond. I mean, I agree. I think everybody here serves with a commitment to uh, take their you know, role seriously to listen to information and give their best judgment at the time of the information we have. So I, I don't think anybody here is doing anything than, uh, you know, acting in the best interest of the town as we understand situations. So 
I think, yes, everyone is being responsible. It's a very simple concept that we have to act responsibly given what we know. And I think everybody's trying to do that. So um, my question was just to inform whether we can do it in three or six months. And also the question is, you know, having these numbers come in at this stage, just making sure we understand it so we can vote in a responsible fashion. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Are you set, Mrs. Ackman? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Parent. This may be asking for a crystal ball, which no one has, but has there been any um, discussion at the from the medical experts of what they're projecting for next year at the state level? Has there been any any guidance at any any point? Um, or are we just kind of going out there alone and trying to estimate what we all think who are not experts on COVID? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Parent. I, I would triangulate that data, but uh, I would say the discussions that, that, that I've been part of would indicate we're going to be in some sort of COVID-related situation in September. That would be my takeaway from the conversation from the State Department of Education, Department of Public Health, and our health officials. I think in terms of planning, um, I certainly would uh, be, be very deliberate and uh, go back to them for, well, I, I would go back to them to be honest, I think just for, for clarification again, but um, and for their best thoughts. But that's what I would take away from the conversations that uh, I've had. And that includes uh, every week we have multiple meetings with the Department of Public Health and our health officials. So that, that, that's on a regular basis that you get that feedback. But that, that's what I'm hearing. But again, no one has issued anything on paper. No one has issued any recommendations or guidance at this particular point. Right. So just pr moving on building on that so that means that if if we're in some sort of COVID related situation in september that means that we will need to have break the extra sections and have the extra staff as we do this year correct i think the proverbial guidance and wisdom is it'll be around so minimally around social distance and if that's the case yes that's what we'll have to do i mean i think mrs parent it's a good point you have to time it and we're, we're working through this budget process before the state is organized around when teachers will get vaccines when the rest of the public will get vaccines, when younger folks will have the ability to get vaccines. So all that'll play out over the summer. So chances are, as that plays out, you know, at least social distancing continues to be in play, PPE continues to be in play, different things like that. Um, Mr. Sini, I believe you had your hand up. You just have to unmute so we can hear you. <laughs> My apologies. Thank you. Um, so again, given the late hour, <laughs> literally, that this has been introduced, I think we got to be very methodical and careful and, and truly understand the MBR implications. I understand we don't budget to MBR, but we typically don't budget uh, non-recurring items, if you will, uh, that we don't anticipate, you know, in the, in the long future to uh, impact our budget. So I, I think it is careful and, you know, relying on legislative action within you know, the very short timetable of the budget uh, discussion is, I think, uh, would be a little risky there. I, you know, Duke, I, I do appreciate you had a conversation with the attorney, but, you know, we've also heard districts handling this very differently, if you will. And I think it would be very helpful for this board and maybe other boards in town to best understand Mr. Mooney's um, opinion on this matter. So we can ask some of these questions directly to our legal expert and how to handle it and understand the differences between districts and, you know, uh, given his breadth of knowledge around the district. So I, again, I, I support kind of the concept. I just want to make sure we don't make any mistakes at this late hour by appropriating uh, such a large dollar amount and then having consequences down the road. So I, just from a due diligence and, and proper process and methodical approach, I think it's really important. You know, maybe we call a special meeting of some sort so we, we have access to Mr. Mooney as a board. Thank you, Mr. Sini. Mrs. McCavin. Small question, but um, Alan, I just want, and Rich, I just want to double check that I understand clearly that this is a preliminary list, but it does still need some reconciliation against some of the other numbers that have been floated out there and some additional work that you all are doing. Is, is that correct? Or this is a final list? Uh, so reconciliation against, uh, when you say, uh, Dale, the other numbers floating out there, are you talking about the, 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 the uh, ad cut list or? 
I think so, but but really, my question, Alan, is 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 the list that Rich just showed to us the final list or not? It's, it's the final list as of today for for ninety days of the school year. Thank you. For six months. Ninety ninety days of the school year. Um, I'm sorry. Follow up. Um, do can I ask a quick follow up? Yes, Mrs. McCallum. And that is, do we need to budget for any of the um, decommissioning of a COVID environment? You don't have to answer that now, but. Um, I'm just, I, I'm not, literally, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of what those things are and I'm sure you can help me think of what those are, but. Um... I'm, I'm sure that um, I would imagine it wouldn't be so large, but I'm just asking, you know, getting rid of all the, the plexiglass and the, um, you know, rearrangement work that has to be done when we move back into a, a more typical operating environment. Is there anything that should show up from a budgetary perspective? Um, I, I just have to ponder that and yeah. have that discussion with Rich. So maybe, um, you know, happy to continue the, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, thanks, Duke. I was just gonna second Mr. Sini's comment earlier uh, given the time and given the size of this number, if we need a special meeting, I'd be all for that. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Um, I think if I could just take a sense of the meeting in that um, I think we want to continue, I think overall budgeting, I'm just saying it, you can agree or disagree. Having some kind of COVID budget makes sense. I think Legally, in terms of our responsibility, it makes sense. We have to look at a COVID budget going into the next year. I'll do some work with other boards. I'll speak to uh, Mr. Mooney about an ongoing conversation. I'll speak to the other boards. I think Mrs. McCammon brought up a point and I think other boards have done this. They may not be building a COVID budget, but they may have gotten a lapsing account or they may have gotten an allocation or an appropriation already. So I think there's various mechanisms that other other towns may be using. So I think it makes sense to um, have a conversation with some of the other boards in town and get their overall thought process. I think uh, if the administration could continue to, to fine tune these numbers, if anyone has additional questions or comments, I think we have kind of a tight timeline to continue the dialogue as we move through this budget process. If there's a special meeting needed, I think we can do that to continue the dialogue around that. So. Um, does that seem fair to move this forward? Any additional thoughts or comments? I, I would just yes. say, I'd just say that the Mr. Minister's advice to us was to, to budget for this. Right. And what he does for the other districts or why they don't do it or there are other vehicles for them to do it or otherwise. And some people may not take his advice. Uh, so. Yeah, I, yeah, before we use Mr. Mooney's time, I'll, I'll speak to the other boards in town and, and get their thoughts. And um, if we need any further dialogue with Mr. Mooney, um, we'll go down that path. Yeah, I mean, Duke, if we can't meet with him, some sort of written recommendation would uh, be helpful too. Um, so uh, maybe I can communicate that uh, in an email to you or, you know, so uh, that can be sent along to the rest of the board. All right. Any other further questions or comments? All right. Anything else to add, Dr. Evans? Uh, no, just for, just for clarification for next week that we'll go through this. Yep. So, is it the sense, sense? Is it the sense of the board? We should uh, the administration should continue to look at a six-month projection um, for these COVID expenses. I mean, we've got the feedback from Deb and. Um, from Mrs. Ritchie and Mrs. Ackman that's been incorporated. Is there anything else? I think Deb, uh, Mrs. McCammon brings up a good point of decommissioning. Is there anything else in looking at that preliminary list that anyone wants to add? I would just throw out Duke, um, maybe six months is the right number. Maybe it's three, maybe it's four and a half, whatever number the board thinks, you know, in their reasonable judgment at this time, that would be it. I wouldn't pick six just to pick six. So whatever that is, I'd love to hear the board's best uh, thoughts at this time. Well, I'll, I'll open it up to the board's best thoughts at this time. Do you have a specific time frame, Mr. Brown? 
Uh, I don't, but I haven't been in touch with our, you know, health department or any other, you know, science department to get any estimate on that. I, this question hasn't come up. So if that question can inform the superintendent's decision and that can be relayed, then I appreciate that. Yeah. And Dr. Adley, to that point, Dr. Adley will, will start that conversation and see if there's a feel out there for a time frame. Well, again, this, this represents 90 days or, or five months, you know, the five months. Okay. Break, you know, so that's okay. Uh, Mrs. Ackman. So again, I'd say that six months was my best guess at a time when we weren't discussing this. So I would take the administration's recommendation for what is the best. And if that's longer or shorter, I think the board needs to hear that. I also think it's the board needs to go through this list. I'm seeing it for the first time as well. And it's a very big number. And if we have questions, I don't know, Mr. Chairman, are you recommending we send those in and they're distributed to the board? Like it is an incredibly tight timeline and a million dollars is a lot of money. I, I don't, I guess what it is, is I think board need, members need time to do their due diligence. Um, and we can't do that without talking to the administration. So maybe it's a special meeting as Mr. Sini suggested, but how, how do we proceed? Because I don't know how to evaluate a million dollars without some time. So Could what you, else? Do I, I, don't, I don't disagree Sorry. with you. So we will, do you want to send this list out or do you want to fine tune this a little more before we send this out to the board? Well, that's what I'll have to, that's, that's have to go out to the board tomorrow, even if I had to fine tune it. Right. Be out tomorrow. Okay. So we can do that. To the, we can get this out to the board. So we'll send this out to the board. Uh, Mrs. Ackman, um, we'll have conversations with the health department, with other boards in town, just to kind of socialize uh, this with them. Um, what are you thinking on a timeline? I mean, what are your thoughts? And, and I would say as you go, I would say as you look through this, then forward any questions into me that we can share with the board and the administration. <laughs> Can I ask a question, dude? Don't we have, you sent around, we have a meeting with um, the Board of Finance on the COVID expenditures. Could we perhaps do a special meeting prior to that? You'll be rolling into that. I imagine it'll come up at that meeting as well, right? That would have to be a special meeting tomorrow night. No, um, prior to, like if that meeting's at 5.30, if we met at five or, yeah. I don't know. but. We already have that meeting and I imagine it's gonna come up there as several members are on this call. That's a that's an option. Mrs. Ritchie. Sorry, I'm having a coughing fit um, and now I've lost my train of thought. So I'll come back to me. <laughs> Guys, it, it, I'm sorry. Mr. Sini. That, that's a, I, I think that's been warned as a special meeting so that can't come up It's the if the agenda has been okay. set or so I, again, I mean, I, I really think it's important that you know we meet as a body. Don't do this over email. Um, and and, and I, again, I get the questions, but we have an opportunity to sit down as a body with more input. Again, I think it's really important that we hear directly from the attorney to understand the differences, um, be, you know, between districts and the, the difference. We talked about it as a board, but you know how we were able to you know, meet statutory requirements in this year, uh, you know, operating in a deficit of what we had budgeted. I know we didn't ever go into deficit in terms of cash flow, but really understand you know, all these questions. John, what I was suggesting is we piggyback off that meeting, which we'll all have to be zooming into, I assume. So to have our meeting prior to that as a board. Right. But uh, you, uh, I'm sorry, Katie, you, you said something like, I'm sure they'll be addressing that. And I, I'm not sure they can because they're, they're just talking about the appropriation based on the special meeting. Yep. I think, I think Mrs. Stein was just using it as a time that we'd all be focused on the second meeting in the app. Um, this is Richie. Now that you're not coughing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't want to give too much work and if it's too much work, please don't do it, but it would be great to, I, Rich, you just do such a nice job with all of our finance committee presentations. So it might be helpful to have some sort of narrative to go along with this, just explaining the rationale behind these costs that you've, that you've included. And I know why I included my costs, but I'm just a minion. So I would love to hear from the experts why they included their costs. Thanks. Mrs. Ackman. So 
I agree um, hearing from Mr. Mooney, even maybe a memo, because I, I do think it's a lot to throw on board members um, to understand. I don't think it's relevant necessarily. Um, well, I think we have to understand his guidance to understand how we're making decisions. Um, I think that would be very helpful. I think also then um, I agree with Mrs. Ritchie to have some narrative of why this and why not and why 90 days versus 45 or 180. Um, I think as, as we look at these numbers, we need to understand them a little bit more. And then I think as a board, we actually need some time, just like we did in any other RC, to go down and press upon why this or, or why not, uh, why not that. So I, I think that this is now becoming um, an RC that, that we haven't had a chance to really look at it. it it's a big budget driver. Um, and I think a strategy both around explaining it to the public, explaining it to the other boards is, is really necessary. So, um, you know, I hate to try to squeeze in another meeting, but I really do think we're going to have to. And if we can't get Mr. Mooney in person, then a memo would be very helpful. Thank you. Mr. Maroney. And just a point on the, this 30, 60, 90, whatever days we choose or we, we, which we're looking for. I think the other part for me is how, you know, uh, Dr. Adley mentioned that the the teachers is a fixed cost regardless if we do one day or, or a year. So that's 36% of that or 362,000 if my memory serves me. That's, it doesn't matter if that's 30 days or 90 days or, or whatever, that would be a, a, a full year's cost to hire the teachers to have social distancing in that. Are there any other costs in there that are similar or is everything then just based on uh, prorated costs for that time. So I think Mr. Maroney brings up a good point. I think where we switch between learning models with the monitors, the agreement is they, they're not paid if they don't work. So I think you almost have to break, break out here. If we start out with these five sections for social distancing, is that contractual for the full year? So it's really not a six month forecast or a 90 day forecast, right? That's for the, that, that's for the year. Okay. Okay, so I think we should break that out, understanding what's contractual that we would have to ride out through the year versus what can stop once we're back in school and don't need social distancing, lunch monitors go away, but those sections may have to stay contractually, right? Yes. Okay. Mr. Brown. I think Tara was first, but... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Brown. Tara. I guess I'll go. Uh, I just following up on that thought, I don't know if we could get like a per diem cost. Uh, again, we may not know what, how many diems, but we could, you know, just get a sense of that versus the fixed costs we're obligated if we open. Mrs. Ackman. So I will say um, I was aware that we could not budget for teachers for a partial part of the year, which is one of the reasons why in my proposal, out of the eight positions I think we required, I put forward forward, knowing that we had a, a intact budget control inside of our budget. And so the board may wanna consider for look to make reductions there, keeping budget control fully intact as a mechanism, and then only budgeting for a part, knowing we have a mechanism um, at, our, at our disposal. So that's what I mean. I think we do need to push upon this list you know, I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks. I think so is Mrs. Ritchie, but I understand other board members have not. So, but those are the types of things we could push on because that would significantly reduce this particular RC, but you would need to keep budget control intact. So there's some trade-offs we may need to make. Dr. Adley. So, so can I just ask the board to help me here just a little bit, just with uh, our administrative task, um, uh, as we look at the different permutations in this, when would, a, the meeting B, if we have one in B, when would you, I'm saying we'll turn this around tomorrow, but the, the more questions come up, the more I'm just thinking, uh, what would be the time frame for the board to get an updated uh, communication about this so that, because I'm just thinking of all the things that we Right. Well, I think also the conversation around these numbers are, these numbers, Rich, 
you're basing these numbers off of what you've already been working on the past year. So these numbers are kind of from what we've been doing for the year. So you're just kind of pushing that forecast forward. I'm sorry, I'm looking for Rich and I don't see him. There he is. So it, it's not like there, anything is new here. These are existing line items that we've tracked, that we forecasted, that we know the cost, whether we're in front, full person or hybrid. So you're just kind of forecasting them for 90 days, correct? Correct. So the teachers, for example, and then the materials uh, for the teachers classes would be a full year because once you split the class, you kind of split the class. So you're not going to combine it again. Um, right. But the LPNs, the part-time custodians, uh, those are based on the, the dollar rate that we know of today, uh, X amount of hours, X amount of days, X amount of locations. Right. Okay. So I think the important question is, what, are the, what information can we get from the health experts as to their thought process on what the fall looks like? Have the conversation um, with some of the other board uh, committees in town about what we're doing. Um, look to schedule a special meeting within the next day or so. So what timeline do you need? Do you need a day, day and a half? And is there anything a board member wants to add to this that they want looked at? I mean, these are kind of standard line items in the RC that we've been working with all year. So there's nothing new here with respect to that. Mrs. McCann. So do the, I ask that as you do your perambulations and talk uh, around town or with the attorneys or we do as a board, that we also discuss the fact that while we can, as you pointed out, a lot of these costs are things we can anticipate because they're based on last year's experience but there may be things going into this coming year that we cannot predict. So if, if, if you know, what, what is, what are people recommending in terms of how they're thinking about unanticipated costs? Again, I would assume it's a special appropriation, but how does that relate to flexibility? You know, let's say we do get a lot of kids in and, and we max out our budget control and we use the sections that we've outlined for COVID and we have uh, four kids who need a para as we did a couple of years ago, how are we going to respond flexibly? Um, you know, I know there's budgetary flexibility in different ways, but I just want us to be prepared to have a conversation as a board about the fact that we can predict what we can predict and not what we can't. Go ahead. I mean, ultimately, Mr. Cameron, I would come back to the board if, I, if, if, if there was a resource that we absolutely needed, I would have to come back to the board. We may have to make adjustments within our own budget and or a appropriation down the line if that's what we needed if it were so at the, at the expense of it was such a such a burden to the district. Mm -hmm. I think Jill to your point we can we can forecast based on conversations with the health department, conversations with Mr. Mooney, something unexpected comes up, you know, we're gonna do what we need to do, but I think we have the appropriation process behind us and the Board of Finance to work through that, use that mechanism. Mr. Sini. Sorry, I'm hitting on all the legal stuff, but yeah, it's part of the discussion with Mr. Mooney. I want to know what reasonable from a legal standpoint stands, yeah, represents, like, and what latitude do we have there? Um, because, again, we're making a lot of assumptions around a lot of unknowns, uh, at least what's been pre presented to us this evening. So I want to know what latitude we have on that subjective, uh, uh, you know, word or, or meaning. All right. Any further questions or comments? Any additional information that we're looking for from the administration? We will get this out this evening or tomorrow. This evening? Sure, it's early, it's not Wednesday yet. It's not as if we can I, I, I print this page and send it to you, but, but I think you'll leave you it, get it you'll, you'll get it out within the next, we'll, we'll get it out as soon as you can. Rich needs to go feed his baby, I'm sure. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Mrs. Parent and Mr. S Mrs. Stein. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you all. Thanks for the conversation. Have a good evening. Thank you for everyone online. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle, thank you. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome and have a good night.